and welcome to the 32nd meeting of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee in 2022. I've received apologies from David Torrance for today's meeting and he's going to be substituted by James Dornan, who joins us online. The first item on our agenda is to decide whether to take item three in private today. Are members agreed? agreed. We'll agree. Thank you. And the next item on our agenda is further consideration of the National Care Service Scotland Bill with two evidence sessions. Both panels will focus on the bill as it relates to workforce, employment, training and development and contractual arrangements. And the first panel comprises of representatives from uh, several professional bodies and regulators representing sections of the health, social care and social workforce. Uh, social work workforce. I do apologise. So I welcome those attending in person. At first, we've got Mary Allison, the Acting Chief Executive of Scottish Social... Uh, the Triple SC. I'll just say that. The Triple SC. Uh, Alison Babbage, the National Director of Scottish Association of Social Work. Kay McVeigh, the Head of Personnel Services at South Lanarkshire Council and SPDS Portfolio Lead for Workforce Planning for the Society of Personnel and Development Scotland. And um, we've got Colin Pullman, the Director of the Royal College of Nursing for Scotland. And joining us online, we've got Char Sharon Wiener Ogilvie, the Deputy Chair of the Allied Health Professions Federation Scotland. So good morning to you all and welcome. I think I'm going to start off by, by asking your views. Um, and and I, will, I will go around all of you um, initially, just to get your, your, your views to, to start us off. My colleagues joining in with other questions will probably direct their questions to each of you. But if you want to chime in, you've got something to add, then just you just have to catch my eye or, or raise a finger and I'll come to you. It would be lovely to think that every question we could have gone the whole panel, but we would just would run, run out of time very quickly if we did that. Um, and for, for, for Sharon uh, online, if uh, you use the chat box to let me know when you want to come in, Sharon. Um, so I'm going to ask about the co-design idea and process because one of the things that we are finding when we're doing our scrutiny of this bill and we're speaking to various stakeholders is the idea of a framework bill which sets out effectively there's going to be a national care service and there's going to be some quite high level things put in statute about that but the co-design process is going to happen after that and inform secondary legislation and I think that's quite different from how legislation normally works. I suppose the nearest example would be the Social Security uh, Bill. I want to know um, from each of you um, this expectation that a lot of the detail is going to be created through this process of collaboration and co-design. Um, do you support this approach or do you have any concerns about it? Midi. Um, I think for the SSSC, as the professional regulator of social work, social care and early years workforce, when we look at um, the bill currently, it, it's not clear um, exactly how professional regulation of the existing workforce would be affected. Um, but Scottish Government have established um, an independent review um, looking specifically at inspection, scrutiny and regulation. Um, and that review um, has started and um, there is a, a lot of engagement and doing that work of going out and speaking to people, understanding their perspectives on what is good and perhaps what not so good about um, regulation at the moment. Um, so I think that process of, of really focusing on how regulation keeps up with the evolving um, landscape and changes in the in the workforce and how it will fit in with the NCS is happening in quite a specific way for professional regulation and it's due to report next June. And I, I know it's quite extensive, the work that that review is carrying out with stakeholders. So effectively that co-design is actually already, really already started yes. and it's a case of, you know, the legislators like ourselves are looking at the framework bill but a lot of this, you know, co-design is underway well underway. Yes, that's right. And our expectation is that the review will um, make their recommendations next summer and then Scottish Government will decide what to do on, on the back of those recommendations. That's very helpful. Thank you. Alison? Um, I suppose the first thing that our members would say is that they're really keen to see change. We really need to see change. 
Um, and we're really keen to be involved in that change and that the commitment to co-design is in principle a really good thing. Um, however, there are some ambivalences and our members say that they can't wholeheartedly support the bill at the moment because they can't see the detail that will affect their work and, and how effective they're going to be. So, you know, for example, Schedule 3 sets out um, all the legislation that is likely to be amended or removed and changed, um, uh, most of which is the, actually the underpinning duties and powers of social work. So there's a bit of a, on the one hand, co-design is definitely um, where, where we want to be and involved in, but um, at the moment we can't really see the, see the detail um, and where, for example, the, the duties, say, of a duty, general duty of welfare, where that may be. Um, keen to see a more national approach to improvement, implementation, and the experiences of people being able to move their support across local authority boundaries. All of that is really good. Um, one of the things that we are finding, perhaps across the co-design um, arena, is that there are um, perhaps some, um, th that social work is not well understood as a profession and that social work as it is practiced now is not the holistic relationship-based profession that people go into it to do. And we may get on to some of the impact that that has on the, on the workforce um, later today. Um, but so the, there is an issue there in terms of what real co-design looks like because it requires people to have a, a full um, understanding and commitment to all the elements within it and all the workforces within it. So your participation in that co-design process is absolutely vital absolutely for that to vital. happen. Absolutely um, vital. But there's a lot of work to be done with, um, um, I suppose, you know, the programme is a large programme and we need to ensure that the, the nature of social work, um, not just the statutory protection work, but the early support, the intervention support for families and, and community strengthening is, is understood and built in there so that we have a stronger social net in Scotland. Thank you. Okay. I think um, in terms of co-design, it's important that all the moving parts are, are involved in that and they've got the, the time and the space to do so. So when I think about the, the workforce element of that at this point in time, they are struggling for the resource to get involved in, in co-design. So in, in social care, we all know uh, the kind of recruitment retention difficulties that there, that there are. Um, and, and if people are not involved in the co-design process, every, everybody does want to create improvement. To create improvement, you have to have space. You have to have space to think and to imagine what the future might look like. But, it, but in terms of where we're at at this point in time, and maybe the reaction that some of the workforce has had generally across the piece um, to, the, to the bill is that the lack of detail does give them a, a, a concern, as you, as you were talking about. And inevitably, change can be concerning for, for people, and you want to involve them in the conversation mm -hmm. so they feel confident about their place in in the future and in, in terms of this particular element of it I think um, because there's a lack of detail there's there's certainly a lot of questions from the workforce um, and because the questions are not being answered they, they, they do feel a little negative to, mm -hmm. towards uh, the proposal. But is there a recognition that it's there's a hope that it's going to be built from the, the ground up rather than top down. That's why the, the legislation's been done the way it is. Yeah, uh, so um, a, a, a grassroots up a, a approach, uh, you know, you want to take the workforce with you, but just yeah. now they're, they're not feeling like that is what's happening in practice. Okay, okay, thank you. Colin. Thank you. Um, much the same to be fair. I mean, the, the issue that we have is we, we actually don't know what the code design means in practice. It's quite vague and that's a difficulty for the workforce. The workforce are under huge pressures, as you all know, at the moment. Um, and we, we'd question if it's the right time to be actually doing it in a lot of respect. Um, it is hugely important we get consensus around about how we develop this because it's such a significant change that's coming in to um, social, well, health, the whole health and social care journey across Scotland. Um, so from our point of view, it's the, the lack of detail that our, our members are telling us that the, uh, it's that bit around about they, they actually don't feel there's 
there may be as much transparency as there should be the next time, th if, as you go forward in the development of the service. So it's something that we need to explore further. And I think people would need to be reassured of what does it mean by co-design, because co-design has to include everybody who receives the services as well as everybody who provides the services. Mm. And that's the key thing for us. Before I go to, to Sharon, can I ask all of you, were any of you involved in the National Care Service Forum in Perth the other month? So you've you've all you've all had that presence, and your members have, have, have been at the, the first of those. Yeah, we 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 were represented at that forum, uh -huh. and I think, but I still think it's far too early, and there's lack. It's it's a lack of clarity of how it's going to go forward. That's the thing that's really concerning people, and it's also we're at the process that the workforce, to be quite blunt, are dealing with a crisis mm. at the moment. And so to what's, start what's thinking too about early? This the forum is too early, or what? What's too early? I think it's the way the legislation that, that you know the, the way that the legislation is going to be developed. It's new for everybody, mm -hmm. if you like, and I think there's real anxiety around about what that will provide in the future. Okay, and I'll come to to Sharon uh, Wiener Ogilvie online. Sharon. Yeah, hello. My name is Sharon, and I'm uh, representing the Allied Health Profession Federation today. As you know, we are a really multiple profession organisation. So I'm representing, you know, twelve. Uh, professions, including physiotherapists, OTs, dietitians, podiatrists, and so on. Um, uh, and although we're very different, we have a very similar focus, and our focus is very much about early intervention, supporting people at home, uh, support for self-management and rehabilitation, so very much reducing the dependency on health and care system. Uh, so our main concern really around the bill at the moment, and it's around the detail, as some of our colleagues have already kind of highlighted, is that there's a really a strong emphasis on care. And we, uh, we're concerned that unless AHPs are uh, really at, uh, involved in, in the leadership um, within National Care Board, that, that that kind of focus on rehabilitation and enablement will be lost because we'll be focused only on care provision. And, and I think we are kind of, you know, really facing unprecedented time in the health and care services at the moment. So unless we maintain that focus on rehabilitation and prevention, we're never going to, um, you know, resolve the high demand that we're going to have. So we very much believe the HPs have a real expertise in rehabilitation, prevention and self-management and will need to be um, at the core uh, in terms of, you know, co-producing the approach going forward. But, you know, to do that, we really need to be at the table at national care boards. We need to have vo uh, voting rights. So we can have the loose uh, kind of framework that was around the Public Body Act, where it wasn't really clear who is on IJBs and so, and so on. So we need the details to enable us really to um, uh, to influence that agenda and to make the real changes that are really required. Um, and our second concern around the bill is really around the commission, and I'm getting into kind of the details here, but yeah, obviously, so we'll, you know, we'll the... stop you, Sharon, because obviously our, my colleagues will come to, to the detail. I was really asking yeah. about the code design process, and, and I think you've made it very clear that you, you, you feel you should be very actively involved in that code design process, but you also allude to, to um, being, being involved in the care boards as they're formed. I'm going to move on to my, my colleagues, but don't worry, there will be ample opportunity for you to come back. Uh, Paul O'Kane. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I'm probably going to direct these questions to Alison and Colin, just because I think they're, they're relevant to some of your submission. But uh, SASMA and their submission said, as it stands, the bill is unlikely to deliver improved quality and consistency of social work services. And Colin, you said that without the Scottish Government first tackling the workforce crisis across health and social care, the bill will not achieve its purpose. And, and I think from the, the answer to the convener's question about perhaps the process, can I maybe just first get your sense of... Does this seem back to front to you? Do you feel that there should have been more input into the framework legislation in order to put things on the face of the bill that could actually affect the things that you spoke about in your submission and then look at how, how we go forward from there? Um, yes, I mean, there are several things that we would like to have seen on, on the face of the bill. Um, um, and, and I think that, that one of the things that we need to be in mind, and think one of the things that makes um, social workers kind of nervous is the amount of, of trust, if you like, that we're being asked to put um, for the bill, which is fairly structural, 
um, very framework and that it will, um, you know, that we will then move towards a situation where we can look at the quality and the consistency. Um, so, um, I w I, sorry, could you ask the question again for... Sure, yeah. So, I, I just quoted back at you your concerns, I think, about delivering quality and consistency. Yeah. And I was asking that, would you rather have seen more detail in the bill? And, the, and you said something I there mean, about the, the face of the bill, but maybe in particular what could have um, made the difference? Abs absolutely. Um, the, the role of social work isn't mentioned, um, and the role in quality and consistency of roles, um, leadership roles, such as the Chief Social Work Officer. Um, there's um, the National Social Work Agency. We would have liked to have seen that on the face of the bill. We think that's particularly important if we're talking about national quality and consistency in, in giving some overarching um, support and direction for um, um, positive and effective implementation um, of, of policy rather than having lots of, um, as we have at the moment, we have the two local authorities and more who, who do um, take policy and implement it in their, in, in their, own, in their own ways. Um, what we don't want, however, is, is to have a, um, a top-down approach. Uh, we understand the need for um, structures that enable um, quality and consistency to happen. Um, however, having the, um, the ability to, for local people and local governance to flex and be responsive um, is also really, really important. Colin. Thank you, Paul. I, I mean, we've been quite clear. I mean, the, the intentions behind the creation of the National Care Service are laudable, absolutely laudable, and I think every single one of us would agree that uh, we need to change. There's difficulties, there's, there's, a, there's a crisis. But uh, for us, yeah, yes, if you're going forward with the legislation, that we would like to have seen more on the bill, in the face of the bill, um, as, I, as I kind of alluded to. But there, there's a, the recognition of the join between health and social care in the current crisis. Um, structural overhaul just at this present time is not what's required. What's required is that we actually start to deal with the workforce crisis that we have because as much as we go forward the bill, if we don't have the right workforce in the future to be able to uh, deliver the services that we want to do, we actually believe if you spent a bit more time around about looking at the current crisis and dealing with the, 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 the difficulties in maintaining a sustainable workforce, you could have probably been more ambitious as you go forward in the future. And Alison wants to come back in, Paul. Um, uh, and, and in terms, I suppose, of social work, we know that there's work going on to look at whether justice social work and um, children and family social work should come in. Um, that, of course, leaves social work profession in a, um, a potentially feeling um, disjointed and not sure of the direction of the future of the profession um, and potentially bringing very significant changes in terms of how we work with communities and families. Um, so that brings a very significant level of anxiety to the profession at the moment. Can I just, um, thanks for those uh, responses. Al Alison, in your opening uh, contribution, when the convener asked the initial question, you spoke about the ambivalence being felt um, towards the bill to some extent, and I suppose people's concerns about um, the second leaving things to secondary legislation and I suppose the changes that will impact on existing legislation, particularly in the social work space. I mean, are you concerned that secondary legislation narrows the scrutiny uh, in terms of what can be, um, you know, a debate in the whole parliament, you know, everyone having their say in it? Are you nervous about that? Um, I, th I think um, in terms of what we've read and understand about parliamentary processes, that, that, that there's there a um, there Okay. Um, so, in in, ter in terms of, of scrutiny, it's it's the not being able to see the pieces as they're coming together. I think that is proving difficult for people. The the power to transfer staff is a huge power. I mean, there are very significant powers 
um, um, in this bill, um, which are needed at some point if we are going to get to a, a much better um, integrated health, social work and social care system. However, um, I think it's perfectly reasonable that people are concerned and anxious about direction of travel because we just can't see the detail yet. Thanks. Thanks very much. It's just to pick up on Paul's point, he said there's ambivalence towards the bill. What I see is it's flat out negativity against the bill. Do you not think or do you think that part of the issue is people are normally used to seeing detail in legislation, but this is a framework bill. And so what comes after with this legislation will be bite sized pieces of legislation that will be able to be scrutinised and interpreted and then agreed on or amended and then delivered. You know, I'm really interested in hearing what you have to say, Alison, and, and maybe Marie as well, in that, you know, the people on the ground are asking for this bill. Um, I just read something about um, an action group from Falkirk that basically said the National Care Service will have equality, dignity and human rights at its heart. It will empower people to make the choices that are right for them. One of my constituents has had eight social workers in eight months. So this legislation aims to I, I know, slim out some of the bureaucracy, make it easier, make it a choice for the people on the ground to choose self-directed support or whatever they want. So I'm interested in that aspect of maybe people need to hear more about what is a framework bill and then what comes after that. So I suppose Alison first. Um, and and the, the, there's something, some, absolutely something in that. Um, I think we got very many pieces of legislation that um, impact on social work. And so there is a kind of a, a, a cognitive difficulty in terms of understanding how those bite-sized pieces will then jigsaw together because occasionally, you know, the, occasionally things rub up. Completely understand the fact that somebody's had eight social workers in eight, in eight months, uh, you know, in a relation, uh, in a profession that has to really understand people, understand their individual um, situations and needs and preferences, their family and, you know, out into community, their employment and their hopes and aspirations. That's absolutely not the place we should be at. And I think that that actually illustrates perfectly the, um, the, the crisis that, again, you know, it's health and social work and social care, all of these professions and professions within them um, are facing. Um, in terms of um, um, how we then... I guess it's going to be communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, the, the fact that there are several things not on the face of the bill, I think, has made people feel that it, it risks a top-down approach rather than actually um, the, the building up approach, which is actually what I think everybody in, in this room would be hoping to see. So there's, there's a bit of dissonance in terms of what's in the bill, but yet what we actually are saying we want to deliver. Um, absolutely, as I said right at the beginning, um, things, things have to change. We have to get to a point, and I speak specifically for social work, where, where we have professions that are sustainable, that people can go, go into, where they can have a career, where they don't burn out, where they're able to support people and deliver um, our, our, um, our aims for things like self-directed support and support for, um, for, for parents so that um, we can deliver the promise effectively. You know, we, we want all of that. Um, it's just that this, this bill is not clear at the moment about how we get from here to there. And there is the risk that in transition, there's a gap. You know, we need to be working on some of this stuff right now. Can I bring in Ron? And then we must move on to a question from Sandish Gohan. We'll have to pick up the pace, colleagues, a, a little bit. We've only got an hour and a half. Sean. Yeah, yeah, just from our perspective, uh, uh, the same issues. I think the lack of details in terms of, you know, what's in and what's out is creating a lot of certainties, uncertainties among staff. I mean, we're very much dependent, our work very much depending on the interface between um, a, a, a acute uh, primary and uh, community services and social care. So, uh, you know, the move, you know, the kind of the 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 bill alluded that there might be staff kind of being able to move from um, the health service into the national care service that does create uh, uncertainty because there's no clarity which 
you know, which staff members were talking about, and, and there is a potential for that actually to create less effective kind of um, a working arrangement. Um, and in terms of um, a in terms of the national care service kind of reducing bureaucracy and you know streamlining thing absolutely welcome that but it all depends on the implementation uh, and if you're still suffering significant workforce issues then actually just changing uh, the structure is not going to deliver what you you want to achieve so so that's our main concern thank you question from sandesh and then i'll move on to our next theme Thank you. I have to say, I think we're used to seeing details in bills because detail and delivery is where a bill will fail. And as I say, I don't get into my car and drive without knowing my destination and where I'm going. And so my question is going to be focused around the co-design process. Um, and I want to know what your understanding is, because my question is, what exactly is co-design? And Colin, you've alluded to that as well. What about people missing, say, people who have palliative care needs? Um, who feeds into it and at what level? And how does the Scottish Government reach out? Who makes the decisions? What's the transparency of the final design? Is there a board that makes these final decisions? And do all voices hold equal sway? So, for example, Colin, the, the Royal College of Nurses um, versus one person that speaks. So there's a lot of questions there, but basically the question is, what do you understand by the co-design process, and is it clear? Uh, to, to Colin first, please. Thank you. Um, I think I've, I've been quite clear. I think that that is that's the problem. We don't know. It's not clear. It's absolutely not clear how the co-design process is going to work um, going forward. And I think that that's led to the anxieties. Not only well, it has led to anxieties within the workforce because that thing around about everybody agrees there needs to be uh, change. There needs to be. Uh, we need to think around about new and innovative ways of tackling the difficulties that we have and not just in social care, it's joined up and we, 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 we sometimes compartmentalise it's the whole care journey. That's why our hospitals are, are full at the moment because we don't have the journey and we don't have the staff in the right place. So it's for me, it's around about much more clarity of how co-design is going to work. I think the issue is everybody should have a voice at the table. Everybody should have a contribution and that's important. And ultimately we're not clear around about how that will all be brought to the end. Where, and, and that's what I say, this is a new way of... of, of delivering legislation. Um, we all need to be taking on that journey, and I think that's why we need to be careful not to rush into this. Things on, because effectively co-design has been discussed quite extensively, and I'm going to... Uh, comparisons between NHS and social care. Paul, you have questions on this? Thank you, Chair. Um, I you know, I think there's been a lot of discussion uh, in the process leading up to the bill and indeed in, in our scrutiny thus far about the importance of parity of esteem uh, or parity between uh, NHS and social care. And, and I wonder maybe just um, as an opener, do you think there are a sufficient clarity in terms of what that parity might look like? Um, I, and I suppose this is really a question, I think, that again, perhaps to Alison and Colin, but I appreciate perhaps um, Sharon might want to have a contribution to that as well. Of course, all panellists, I'm sure, would be keen to answer, but um, maybe if I can start with Alison, is that OK? Um, thanks, Paul. Yes, the um, parity of steam, I think, is, is a really interesting one because it's a, a, a phrase that's really easy to say, but in terms of what we, what we mean... Um, it's a bit, perhaps a bit more tricky. Um, in terms of parity esteem for social workers, my, my constituency, what that means is social workers being able to work as autonomous professionals, where their judgments um, are viewed as being, as being sound, where their assessments are, are taken um, with um, the, the kind of seriousness that, um, that they should be, where there is not a constant battle um, for um, each piece of support that somebody may need for for budget, okay? Um, it means being around the table um, with our colleagues in health and in social care with our third sector colleagues in terms of delivering s a, a smooth transitions between life stages and between services. Um, it means, for example, having terms and conditions that are uh, in some way equitable 
Um, at the moment, of course, in inter integrated joint boards, integration joint boards, we have um, two sets of, at least two sets of terms and conditions. So, you know, um, some of you will know that mileage is a pro project for us, but if you're employed by the NHS, you get 61p a mile, but somebody who's employed by a local authority who might sit next to me will get 45p a mile. Okay, so um, I think there are a lot of levels to parity, but um, treating social work, um, you know, social workers train for uh, four years. Um, many have masters, many have PhDs, and, and beyond. It's um, you know it's it's something that takes time to to train to do, and I think uh, we would like to see that properly recognised. Um, thank you. Um, sorry. In respect of nursing in particular, and if we look at the bill and the look of the contribution of nursing within social care, I don't think it's as recognised as it should be. We're changing, care's changing, and the delivery of care, uh, more complex care in homely situations, i.e. in people's homes or in care homes, needs to be concentrated and developed. And I think nursing has a unique contribution to that. So I think we need to make sure, wherever that is, whether it be care boards or whatever, that uh, nursing... Um, like every profession wants to have a voice, but nursing has a key voice, we think, uh, going forward. The issue of parity of esteem is hugely important when it comes to not only the, the, the voice at the, the governance tables, but also that recognition when people are within the workforce, wherever they work. Um, and uh, clearly you're not going to expect me not to mention the issue around about fair work. Pay terms and conditions is a key issue across health and social care, uh, and that is uh, one of the one of the issues that are le is leading to the crisis, and you're all aware uh, where we are in relation to the health service. Um, social care pay, uh, and the pay in there is, uh, uh, frankly, um, upsetting when you look at what some colleagues are paid in relation to. And it's, there's no surprise that we have a crisis in social care workforce as well as we do in the health workforce currently. And call in about that um, aspect of parity around things like terms and conditions. Um, but there is another aspect around um, regulation in that the social care workforce is more fully regulated than the health workforce. Um, so support workers in social care are regulated, bringing that protection for service users and also driving up the qualification of that workforce. I think approximately 40% of adult social care workers are qualified through regulation, whereas um, in the healthcare uh, arena, the equivalent support worker role is unregulated. So one of the questions um, from our perspective about the NCS is how do you um, bring, is it appropriate to bring regulation across a wider workforce within the NCS? And the independent review is looking at how there is scrutiny of all aspects of the NCS. So I think that is an, another area of parity that is important. Oh. Thanks, uh, convener. Um, I wonder if uh, I can ask Kay, perhaps coming from that uh, personnel and that development background, um, what, what is your sense of what the bill needs to do? So we had a conversation there about what's not in the bill, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I, I, and just you know, regardless of that process, what are the key kind of actions you think in terms of? driving that parity, um, particularly from a, a local authority point of view? Yeah, it was, uh, it, it, it was interesting, Alison, you, you mentioned that it's easy to say but, but hard to do, and uh, I sit on the fair work groups uh, and the, the, the National uh, Workforce Strategic Forums. I, I, kind of, I get a sense of what's going on both within a, within a local authority perspective but also in the kind of wider, wider context. So I would, Colin, a lot of what you were saying was chiming uh, with me in, in, in terms of the, the workforce. It, it, in terms of terms and conditions, uh, it is a difficult thing because there are so many employers involved in this and you've got employment law as part of um, one, of the, one of the difficult things that we need to overcome. So it, there does need to be a, a fair bit of, um, I think, further discussion around about how you can make changes. You know, the 61 pence versus the 45 pence the occupational uh, therapist who, who works under local government conditions versus the OT that, that works in health paid two different things. You've got huge structures behind that in terms of uh, job evaluation, pay models. These are not easy things to, to change. And actually, there, there's not much opportunity within what we've got just now to have a, a good conversation round about it. But I suppose it's not just about pay and it's not just about the, the mileage rates. It's probably a, a broader thing round about modernising terms and conditions of employment, but more fundamentally at this point in time, I, I would concur with what colleagues are saying about we're in crisis. 
So actually, we need to be doing something right now, not waiting for, for the bill to, to answer the problems. Yes, continue on the improvement journey for the future, but I, I see from a, a workforce planning perspective a really poor position that is deteriorating quite rapidly. And I'm sure, Colin, you'll see the same in, in your own area. Can I bring in uh, Sharon? Yeah, just around the, the workforce um, that, that I agree, it's, it, it, there are issues with parity around terms and condition, but it's not just around the pay, the, the pay, it's also around support, supervision, training, career pathways, uh, where um, there is no parity. Uh, between local authorities and health, um, and we're already kind of seeing parallel services happening between, you know, the health service um, and um, a local authority because of those differences. So absolutely important to support the workforce, not just in terms of paying conditions, but also training, development, and career pathways. Thank you. Um, we move on to talk about the National Social Work Agency and questions led by Evelyn Tweed. Evelyn. Thanks, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, the policy memorandum states that a national social work agency would be expected to provide national leadership, oversight, investment and support to the profession. What functions should it perform that aren't covered by other bodies or agencies? And I'd like to ask Alison first. Please. Thanks. Um, and I think I've already mentioned um, support for implementation um, and, I suppose, consistency of the, the profession across Scotland. Um, I think that uh, people in Scotland have... Um, it's perfectly reasonable that they should expect a, some sort of consistency in the way that we, uh, we approach um, the social work tasks. Um, and the role that we perform in identifying need and unmet need um, in the way that we support um, our commissioning colleagues to develop services that are going to meet the um, individual and community needs in particular areas. So um, I think implementation is, is going to be a really key thing there. I think in terms of um, supporting, um, I suppose, knowledge about what works, in terms of integrating research um, um, quickly and effectively into uh, the practice um, of social work and the decisions um, that are made. Um, as you'll know, um, times and cultures and knowledge change very quickly. Um, and instead of having a lot of different people across the country doing that work, it would be really helpful to have um, um, ha to have a single agency that um, is, um, and I think this is one of the things that we're keen on, is that a, a level of independence from government is, is required. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons that we were sort of disappointed not to see it on the face of the bill, um, given that it um, is, is a role that we would hope would not be dependent on the kind of nature of administrations, shall we say. Um, and, and also, to be frank, quite often social work needs to be critical of its, its governments. Um, so um, we want it to be further um, independent. Um, we expect it to offer a home, I suppose, for the excellent work going on around the strategic approaches to getting um, social work students' placements in terms of supporting newly qualified social workers, in, in terms of um, there's already work going on about advanced practice framework, which is about different career pathways. Um, and, and so giving a place, I suppose, for a social work career that is in some ways equivalent to um, the, the Macron agreements for teachers or um, Agenda for Change um, for nurses in the, in the health system. So we'd see all of that as, as really um, um, important in terms of um, getting um, appropriate levels of consistency and support for, um, for social workers. Um, over, the, over the years with austerity, the support for social workers in local authorities um, perhaps has diminished somewhat in terms of training development opportunities. Okay. Does anyone else want to come in on that one? Yeah, I suppose just to, um, I think Alison's articulated quite well what, what the hope is that the National Social Work Agency would bring um, from our perspective as the, the regulator um, for us understanding and, and working with government on how we will um, work with the National Social Work Agency in continuing to, to set the standards and quality assure the um, education of social workers and the continuous professional learning is something that I think is really important that is fleshed out in, in due course. 
Evelyn, uh, have you got any more questions or will we move on to your colleagues? Uh, I've got one more question. Okay. Um, I understand the Triple SC uh, <coughs> support the creation <coughs> of the new agency. Um, but what do you foresee as your future if, if it comes into being? Well, we, we are, of course, are the regulator of social work, social care, and early years. And um, our understanding is that we will still retain that professional regulation role, which is about um, registering that workforce, ensuring that they're working to the standards in our code of practice, and promoting and, and regulating the, the um, qualifications and ensuring the qualifications are meeting those standards. So um, we don't see those core um, uh, functions that we carry out changing specifically in relation to social work. Okay, thank you. Paul? Um, and perhaps briefly just following on from that, it, do you feel that there, there should have been a broader discussion in the, the bill and should there be a broader discussion after the bill about, I suppose, the role of IIIC care inspector, where that sits and how in that interacts and then I suppose the dotted line almost that might exist to a national social work agency? I mean, do you think there's enough detail on that or do we need to do more thinking? Review comes in, and all of those questions will be captured, I expect, in the work that the, the review carries out. And I know um, Dame Sue Bruce, who chairs it, has already issued her call for evidence and set out the themes that um, she's asking people to, to respond to around that. So I think those questions should hopefully be, be flushed out through that process. Yeah, if I can just briefly follow up, but do you think there is a danger that we're legislating for a national care service here before we have? the detail of that review, you know, is that again something that should have been in the bill in the first place? I, I think it's certainly complicated and um, from, for the independent review that they, they will be looking at, uh, they've been asked to look at how to scrutinise all aspects of the National Care Service and yet the, the extent of the National Care Service itself hasn't been, been fully decided. So I think it certainly is complicated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, move on to a discussion around MDTs and Stephanie, you're leading on that. Thank you very much, Convener, and thanks for being here this morning. Um, yesterday, we, we paid a visit to Granite Care Consortium in, in Aberdeen, and uh, it's a range of 10 providers. We also had people from the Health and Social Care Partnership there as well, and they talked quite a lot about moving away from time and task model to an outcome-based um, delivery system. Um, so they're doing some of that work just now and how that's bringing the capacity to the table for them. Um, Shona from the Health and Social Care Partnership also described it as the providers are like a spider's web over the top of the city that are pulling everything together. So I'm wondering, do you see opportunities to improve multidisciplinary work um, by taking this approach through the National Care Service? And Talis and first, please, thanks. Um, I think there's huge opportunities which have begun to be explored um, in the, the world of integration. Um, um, but of course, what, what, what we've created in, in integration is there are different integration models across the, the country in terms of children's services, in terms of justice, um, what's in and, what, and what's out. Um, out. Outcomes, we've been talking about outcomes in my career for 20, 25 years. Um, and what the stuff that seems to get in the way of outcomes is some of the bureaucracy that we, we put in place, the administrative tasks, the administrative burden. burden. Um, in setting the bar report, uh, I think 78% of social workers said that um, they have a very high administrative burden and that they're spending 40% of their time on administration tasks. Now, that clearly reduces the time, A, they can spend with people who, who need services, but also the time that it takes to build and coalesce a real multidisciplinary team. Um, I think key things for multidisciplinary teams are that we have round tables. The third sector is really part, part of that, you know, not just kind of linked through our commissioners. Um, it's really important that these teams that work in localities that they understand around needs and communities, that they can, they can be seen by, that they're accessible to, that then they develop trust and understanding, which I think is particularly important for social work, which has become, um, for some people, a, a somewhere where they'd rather not set, set foot, to be, to be frank. We would very much like to um, kind of regain that ground. Um, so having small enough areas um, and connections with communities um, so that teams can really work together and have the time to do that. These things can't happen if people are 
running around, um, you know, don't have the capacity. Um, and I think this is the message that, that's coming to you today from everybody here, is that the capacity to engage and be involved in the co-design is, is, is tricky, but also in the, in the field, the, um, the capacity to deliver um, th thoughtful, um, relationship-based and holistic approaches with, with options really looked at and tailored to individuals in the whole spirit of, of self-direct support is really tricky at the moment. Yeah, thank you. I mean, multidisciplinary teams are key to all of this uh, within the legality, uh, within the localities. Uh, artificial barriers cause huge issues between organisations, and we, we need to. Uh, it's interesting when you put teams together, they work through it, and sometimes we put structural walls up for them, and we need to be very clear. We don't, we, we don't do that. Uh, I've, I've talked before about how the uniqueness of nursing and other professions have within a multidisciplinary team, and, and that's the beauty of it. It's about having the right people in the right place to deliver that at that right point of care. And that's what integration is all about. Um, I think that does lead me to when we're developing and we're preparing for that. That's why I, I suppose we, I was disappointed in that, that there was no reference in the in the bill to the health and care, the, the, the safe staffing legislation, because that in itself would help us develop and prepare for multidisciplinary teams in the future by having the importance of workforce planning, because I think we are too insular in looking at whether it be healthcare or with social care when we're looking around about um, workforce planning, and that's something that will make make future multidiscipline teams work for the, for the people they care for. Fantastic. I was wondering, actually, if Sean wanted to come in on this. Yeah, I'll be in, Sharon. Yeah, um, I think I think the other the other thing is really important here in, in terms of making it more effective is is the issue around data sharing uh, between health and social care. And if you look at kind of the evaluation work that uh, Health Improvement Scotland have done about uh, around uh, integration approaches, for example, neighbourhood care. Certainly, those kind of basic lack of infrastructure um, around uh, record sharing and data sharing uh, comes in the way of actually people working together. And we are seeing that in our uh, discharges from hospital. It can take, you know, two hours for a nurse to fill in, you know, all the information in order to discharge someone into the community. So the burden of bureaucracy is huge and, and no kind of change in structure would make that more effective unless we kind of, uh, you know, streamline some of those uh, of, of those uh, bureaucratic needs um, uh, that exist in the mo at the moment and, and until we kind of get kind of data sharing agreements better. So I think these are, you know, these are the, the key things that we need to work on. Thanks. Thanks very much. That's really interesting, actually, because um, one of the points they made yesterday was that last winter they had one of the lowest delayed discharge rates across Scotland and they felt that this was a huge part of it there. Um, and that was really helpful, Colin, as well, um, looking at, you know, what else we could put in the bill. So I'm wondering from the rest of you there, is there anything else that you would like to see in the bill to, uh, to help dis multidisciplinary working be more effective, in particular around early intervention and, and preventative care too? Thanks. I, I don't think there's anything specifically I would add on that. Okay. Um, I think in terms of I mean, uh, early intervention um, and early support um, is, is incredibly important. And if we want to you know, reduce the kind of individual crises and the, the impact on public services and improve people's independence, that's absolutely where we need to be. In terms of um, data, um, uh, we, we could share it so much more, more effect effectively and efficiently. Personally, in my career, I've worked on data collection since about 2005, done some, some kind of big projects. It's, it's never as easy as we think it's going to be. Um, in, I would say in the last few years, we still have issues um, with um, assumptions about GDPR. Um, I personally have, a, have an example, I'll tell you very quickly, which is where um, there were two nurses in the same NHS board, one working in the hospital, one in the prisons, and they wouldn't they felt they couldn't share information, or one of them felt they couldn't share information. Okay, so it, the, the, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of um, how we get better with the data that we've already got, how we share it, and um, uh, how we enable professionals and individuals to make the most of it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, 
So in terms of data sharing and using that effectively to, to deliver outcomes, this, this isn't new, new stuff. This is uh, things that we've been, I think, been struggling with for, for a while. The, the technology, are we going for a system? You know, there's antiquated systems. They don't talk to each other. It just makes life uh, more difficult than, than it needs to be in an integrated uh, world. But I, I wanted to maybe just touch a little on, on culture and trust, because it's been mentioned a, a couple of times here, and uh, I'm going to be radical and say sometimes structures don't really matter if you've got people in a room who feel they're empowered to go and just do stuff. Uh, and and that's what we're lacking a, a little bit. You know, the, your your social worker example, one not feeling like she could share, and and the other one could. And what did they think was going to happen if they did share? Uh, so it is about you kind of allowing that space. And as Colin said, kind of people people together working for for an outcome. Um, over overall, there are, there are some I think projects on the go that may help on the, the data sharing side. The kind of Microsoft Federation. Don't ask me any questions on that. I just know it's a thing. <laughs> More detailed questions uh, on no, data sharing don't. later on, but you, <laughs> forewarned. Uh, but but you kind of you know the practical aspects of this that that turn up in in teams. You know they can they maybe just can't organise meetings between each other because they're not on the same Outlook calendar. And mm. uh, th these are things that could be simpler. But, but fundamentally, people will find a way if you give them permission to do it and the culture's right that says they can just get on with it. Yeah. Sharon wants to come in. Yeah, so for, for us, I think we very much uh, think that we, we need AHP leadership, um, you know, at the centre around kind of strategic planning and commissioning to really ensure that this prevention and rehabilitation agenda is maintained. Um, so, and, and really to kind of change some of the, the planning and commissioning practices so they're focused on, on outcomes. And we have seen some areas where HPs have not been involved in this kind of focus on, uh, on uh, outcomes has been removed and it's, uh, it's all around activity and, and output and opposite. So, um, so for us, it's about the details about HPs being really right at the center there uh, having a leadership role within those care boards to be able to influence this rehabilitation and prevention agenda. Thank you. Emma. Thanks, convener. Just back to the issues of multidisciplinary team working. You know, I, I used an example earlier of uh, one person that had eight social workers. So, but, but I've also heard examples of a support worker that would assess or, or would be able to go and look after somebody and then see a deterioration that would require a step up in care. But currently that requires then referral back for further assessment, which then takes time when it's obvious to the support worker that an additional um, care might be required. So as part of multidisciplinary team working, would it be better if this kind of direct engagement would, again, flatten the bureaucracy so that faster response times could be delivered for somebody that's needing their care escalated. I see Collins nodding about that. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll come out if that's, that's all right. Uh, absolutely. It, it's, we, we need to empower teams to be able to deliver care, and we do put bureaucracy in, in their way and that's where the joined up working if you like doesn't work because this issue that so for example somebody maybe needs stepped up care it could mean that they need district nursing support for example that then needs a referral to go through that referral goes through, that slows everything down for the patient the patient's not getting the care where actually if they're all in an integrated team it's very very quick they they they, they have a commu direct communication we rely on each other's professional judgment, we make a decision, and then very, very quickly, the care can be provided by the right person. And that's what we all need to be looking at, is how do we get the right person to deliver that right point of care? And, and that's why I was saying that a lot of the time we put artificial barriers in place. And we've all spoke about the bureaucracy and the systems that don't speak to each other, which put just barriers in place, not only for the staff, which are frustrating, but ultimately for the patients who are receiving the care. So I absolutely agree. It's exactly what we heard of yesterday from the Granite Care Consortium. And they said to us that what they've got is almost a model for how care boards should work. Um, that, that ideal, so it can be done. So that was really interesting to hear you framing it that way and your response, because that's exactly those of us who were in Aberdeen yesterday heard that in action. 
uh, in Aberdeen. So very interesting. Thank you, Emma. Gillian, you had a question before I move on. Thank you. Um, just actually to build on what Collins um, just said, obviously there's been concerns that community health care is not defined in the bill. Um, you've alluded to some of the services and, and professions that should be able to speak to each other and work together easily. Um, in your opinion, what services and professions do you think should be under this heading of community health care? Well, I think clearly I can speak um, much more with um, confidence about nursing. Nursing needs to be a key part of it. Uh, it's not part of the face of the bill and it's not... Um, some of our colleagues would say that they're not fully, don't feel fully recognised. So for, for me, uh, it has to be, everybody within the journey needs to be included. They need to be recognised. And it is that link between health and social care. Mm -hmm. We are not good at that linkages. And we're, we're at that point where, look at the amount of delayed discharges we have in our hospitals today. And that is a, is a result of not having good communication and teams. And actually the other thing is, and you're not going to, uh, this is not going to be any surprise that I'm going to raise this, it's a lack of workforce within the community to be able to deliver the care. We, we have not um, supported a development of the workforce that's required to meet the increasing care needs. Thank you. Uh, James, James Dornan, do you want to come in? Yes, if you don't mind, convener, thank you. The, we've, we've just heard from uh, Mr Pullman there that, that about the sort of barriers that are put in place between the workers from Work, working closely together. I was on the CHCP 12, 11 years ago in Glasgow, and I saw the same problem was not between the workers, but between those who held power, who found it much more difficult to, to trust the workforce to work together. How do you see, do you not think that maybe the, the care act might, the care service might help that, might smooth over some of the, the problems that still exist? I know it's got better since then, but but it still exists between the two organisations. And that's directed to Colin. I, I think the, the issue at the moment is, is there not more things that we could be doing currently with the current services in relation to how we get people to be able to have that empowerment to be able to work with their colleagues? You've talked about your experience in, in the Granite City. That shows you it can work. It can work now. Why are we not learning from systems that are currently in place mm. and removing these artificial barriers where they exist? Mm. So, I, I mean, I, 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 it is an internal frustration for colleagues the, the issue around about care is blocked because of these artificial barriers that are put in place. Mm. And I think the, the point that Mr Dora makes around about the, 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 it's that empowering point of people, in people who are in uh, positions of decisions to empower staff to be able to, if you like, and, and take this the right way, just get on with it, because yeah. that's what they want to do. But, that, but at the same time, the, the people at Granite Care Consortium said to us that best practice that they've got, they'd like to see replicated in a national care service, in care boards across Scotland, and that was a vehicle for And they actually said that to us, get on with the national care service so that that can happen. So that's an interesting uh, I, I, I think it's that interesting. If, if you've had a positive experience, you may have more confidence in moving towards a care service, mm -hmm. whereas a lot of people are not having that positive experience at the moment, and the lack of detail is causing anxiety, and they're worried that we get too thrown into... We've all been involved in large structural straight shake-ups over a number of years, and people lose focus. It becomes about the structures and not about the people we care for. OK, thank you. Um, We'll bring in Alison, and I must I must move on to other colleagues. Alison, and I suppose we're we're, we're mentioning this, but slightly skirting round. Um, we've we've talked about wanting you know teams that work together. To do that, they need to understand and have control of budget. We've heard um, Mr. Dornan there talking about you know how sometimes the kind of senior management perhaps hasn't come together. A lot of this is around how budgets work and how resources work, and I think we need to be kind of quite clear that if we if we can get to a point where to be blunt, we need more res more resource in the system, but also that where local teams can have access to it easily and decide where it is best spent, then I think we'll be able to realise some of the benefits that we're all looking for. OK, thank you. Um, Emma Harper, workforce pressures, it's already been talked about, so if you want to maybe fill in the gaps in your questioning, and then... Uh, 
Sure. Uh, thanks, Convener. I will be really quick. I'm just thinking about the bill and the fact that we've got recruitment and retention issues across social care, health and social care. You know, valuing people, getting them into the workforce. I know Dumfries and Galloway College have got care courses that really look to career development, for instance. You know, I was a clinical educator. I was a nurse who taught nurses how to... Um, provide care in various things at home, central venous access, things like that. So I'm interested in what you think the extent of the bill will help address um, recruitment, retention, especially if a standardised approach to career development is part of the proposals in the bill. I don't know if, if Kate, Kate's looking directly at me, so... <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I think... I'm not certain the bill will help in recruitment and retention. We are where we are at this point in time, and quite quite frankly, we just don't have enough available workforce in, in Scotland to fill all the roles that we've got, whether it's health and social care or many other places where we're struggling uh, to recruit. I, I have got a real concern about retention, because I, I can see retention is a, a growing issue, so um, health colleagues will... Um, certainly are seeing the, the same impact that we're seeing at this point in time, which is the, the pandemic's had its impact, people are leaving earlier, uh, staff are looking for uh, an easier easier role. I, I'm not sure there's there's hope in the in the bill that um, we'll, we'll change that rapidly, but we could do something right at this time. So in terms of career pathways, in, in terms of standardising approach to training, etc., et those are things we could be doing right now. And uh, you know, that worked well, I think, in the expansion of early years. We had a good programme round about that and we saw um, a, a good structured activity in terms of bringing people in who weren't there previously. We, we've not quite got the same programme there around about health and social care. OK. And then Colin? Yeah, we certainly would welcome the emphasis that there is in the, in the bill on uh, investing in training um, for the social care workforce because um, there is a requirement once registered with us to obtain the qualification, but a really um, mixed uh, bag in terms of where the funding for that training mm. comes from. Some employers will fund, some won't. Um, so access to training is a challenge and the um, concept that the National Care Service may assist with that is certainly something we welcome. And just to pick up on, on what you said there, Kay, um, we're seeing um, our, our register um, for people working in early years increasing mm -hmm. um, as we're seeing the, the rollout of um, the, the funded hours and, and a, a really high level of qualification in that workforce. Um, so I think 73% are fully qualified. So seeing that absolutely has been successful. Thank you. Colin? Yeah, training and development is key to the development of services at all level of, levels of practice. That's both the entry and um, advanced practice. But what we'd say, looking at the bill itself in Section 24, we would say it needs to be strengthened around about training. As it, At the moment, it's, uh, it says that care, care boards may provide training. We think it should go further than that, and it should be compulsory that they should be mandated to provide training. Yeah, thank you. Emma, do you have a follow-up, or can I move on? Um, just a quickie follow-up. I, I, I'm sure, um, Colin, that you would welcome the fact that the bill does basically say the Scottish Ministers and Care Boards may provide training because that hasn't been the case before. And we know the importance of teaching people moving and handling and infection control um, and prevention measures, especially that we've seen during the pandemic. So um, I take on board that you think that, that it might need to go further, but... Just a quickie question. Do you, I suppose you welcome the fact that it's in there in the bill in the first place. Well, absolutely. Welcome that it's there, but as I say, we'd like to see it strengthened, and so it's mandated that it, it has to be delivered, not me. OK, thank you. Um, uh, Paul, you have questions around transfer of functions on staff. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, we've heard quite a lot of evidence about this area, uh, and I suppose the known unknowns, if you like, um, around this in the bill. So I, I think really just to ask um, what the, your view is in terms of uh, the approach being taken by government uh, to seek um, to kind of... So within the bill, there is a power. So I suppose the question is, one, what, what does that say to staff in terms of morale? Uh, and secondly, what are the main concerns of staff? And I'll maybe start with Kay, if that's possible, convener. Yeah. So I mean, the first, probably the first thing I, I heard from colleagues was that there's a bit of inequality there. You're talking about local government staff, for example, uh, potentially being caught with 2P, but 
but health staff definitely not caught by Chupi. So that, that's probably the first thing that really gave the, the workforce a bit of a, um, a, a concern. But the minute you, you talk about those kind of changes, people want to know, what does that mean for me? And Chupi is complicated. You know, it, inevitably, um, if, I, if, I, if I cast my mind back, we've got local government reorganisation and, and people moved in that. It took us years uh, to try and harmonise terms and conditions. And it was very unsettling for people because you're... You're, you're bringing different cultures together and, and uh, that can be an issue in itself. Probably more recently uh, was the creation of the Single Fraud Investigation Service, which took years uh, to roll out. And that, that was a very small number of employees within a, a local authority uh, environment joining that, that kind of national um, service. But it, it does worry people. And this is where you kind of need to keep the, the communication with the, the workforce up. You know, they'll ask questions. What does this mean for my pension, for example? Which which isn't something... You know, people have misconceptions about what Chupi will and will not cover. So it might be it might be like for like, or it may not, or you may feel that you're you're not getting access to the uh, the, the same benefits that, that you previously had. But when you bring in this level of uncertainty, it's maybe a level of uncertainty that is just one step too far for individuals. Um, so that is perhaps what's you know, that, that level of uncertainty, the, the thought round about Chupi is perhaps what's driving uh, some of the workforce reaction. You need more clarity on that from, from the Minister, because that's, that's helpful for us to know. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, it's very personal. So, it, you know, there, you've got a multitude of people with uh, different terms and conditions, so they want to know what it means for them. You know, and it's not, a, it's not an easy answer to give. It, it does need a lot of work behind it. And do you think it would have been better to do this on the face of the bill to give people certainty, or, or, or not at all? Well, That's I, caused a lot of things. Yeah. So uh, I think the minute you say "chupi," people get worried. They think about, "I'm going to be transferring employers. What does that mean for me? You know, what what protection does it give me? You'll get the you'll get the individuals and also their representatives, the trade unions, asking the same questions. And actually, you, you don't know enough detail at this point in time to know what the answers are. So it's hard to put that on the on the face of your your bill. Uh, I suppose the the single fraud investigation service used a, a, a different vehicle for moving staff from from councils to that that national body. It's much of a muchness. It's just a different vehicle, um, but but it still had that level of concern, and it, and it took a considerable period of time to work through. I've got, I've got a brief follow up on. Brief follow up. Cost. Welcome to Stephanie. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion in recent weeks about cost um, in this committee and in other committees that are scrutinising this legislation. I mean, are you concerned in terms of the, the cost to set up new services and in terms of doing that transfer to staff? I mean, is that a worry for local authorities? The, the change in structure is is a worry in, in itself. So if you, if you don't know what the future is going to look like, then it's difficult to cost... You know, what, what it's going to entail, but but if you think about those experiences that, that were in place, you know you, you then have to think about harmonising terms and conditions. It's an easy thing to say, but it's a costly process to go through, and, and actually it's quite contentious. Um, I, I think at this point in time we've got no idea really what the cost may be in in the longer term because we don't know what the shape or form uh, that we're, we're aiming for might might look like. Stephanie. It just really, really briefly, Kate, to pick up on a wee point you made there about, about staff failing, you know, they don't know what's going to happen, they don't know where they're going to be, um, about their terms and conditions. Um, just for clarity, I thought 2 pay meant that you had to have terms and conditions that were at least as good as those that you had previously. That, that's a lot of work for employment lawyers, uh, right. but, but you can, you'll transfer over with what you're, what you're at. You might not necessarily be able to stay in the same pension scheme that you're in. Right. Okay. Uh, which is a big concern in, in amongst uh, the professions that, that are covered within that, that bill because they're all very different. So, for example, I'm in a local government pension scheme. I've been in it long enough that I have some protections in that that I wouldn't have in a, in a new scheme. Oh, that's really helpful to know. Thanks. Mm. I'd just like to make a kind of a couple of observations on the, the transfer of functions and staff because, of course, what we're really talking about here is adult services staff. Mm. And if you read through the policy memo and kind of think about who that's likely to be at the moment, 
it actually, I think, is referring most directly to um, so social workers, the paraprofessionals, the commissioners, and their support staff who are currently in local authorities who are in um, who are most likely to be the, 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 the group that will be looking at their futures, if you like, most directly, um, in that um, um, care services may, may stay as regulated care services uh, and providers. So um, it's just to kind of point out that at the moment that is a particular issue for social work and the, the connectors. The other problem for us is what happens if social work staff don't move into the National Care Service, which um, would likely mean that there would be a separation of the workforce from the, um, the duties and the powers that would be in the legislation. So if the care boards have the duties and the powers, right, but that social workers remain with local authorities, and I'm using social workers, that's our, our profession, but then what we have is um, a disconnect, potentially, with the um, a, a how and who delivers on those duties and powers and risks of perhaps commission services, which is not something that our members would support. Okay, thank at you. All. We move on to uh, training and research. Uh, Sandesh. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start uh, with Kay, if I may. Um, so does the bill, as laid out, uh, guarantee robust training for all staff that are being transferred? Uh, I think as we've, as we've heard earlier on, it, it talks about me provide, uh, I think in terms of robust training and support for staff. I'm not sure you can see that in the bill as it stands just now. You certainly would have to have much more detail around about that. So, with the recruitment and retention issue, and certainly uh, I've heard Alison say before that the average social worker is six years in, in post. Um, we lose 25% of newly qualified social workers in the first um, six years of practice. So, so with recruitment and retention issues, there is a, a pressure on staff. Mm -hmm. In my experience in the NHS, one of the first things to go is training and research. So how could this bill protect staff when it comes to research and training? It starts off with additional resource, because as, as we stand just now, so if I think about the teaching world, for example, there is very protected time in the teaching world for those kind of training and development uh, type activities and a whole structure around about research and bringing that research back into practice. There, there's not an equivalent in the in the social work environment, for example. I'm looking at you, Alison, because you just have to be sitting next to me. But uh, and I, I'm not sure in the bill as it stands just now, you can you can see that that, that will be something, an output from the bill. Can but you, but you need the resource to do it in the first place. Yeah. Thank you. Colin, you want to go? Yeah, very quickly to add to what I've said. I mean, I, I think it needs strength and not the me, it must. Uh, provide training. I think that would be a key thing. And, I, and you're absolutely right. It is the first thing that goes. It's the first thing that people look at to save money is the training development. And actually, it's the key thing that you shouldn't move. I think the other thing is just to, to point out that it also needs to align, and I've said this before, is the workforce planning. And that's why the link to the health, uh, the safe staffing legislation is key for me, because it covers around about the workforce planning. And that includes the workforce development as you go forward. Sorry, just very quickly as my, my last um, question. We always focus on training. And, and if we know training is, is vital to everything, including your just well-being as you, as you go through your profession. But what about research? How can we ensure that there is research done by people who want to do research? Uh, and I was going to lead on to questions from Gillian about data, but there should be rich data. So how can we ensure that people who want to do research from social work from, from other areas get to do that, if I could ask Alison. Um, I, I suppose, again, it's making a culture where this happens. Mm. Um, um, Kate's <laughs> talked about um, having time. So if we, we want to enable um, you know, people who are working to undertake pieces of research that help, we need to make time and make structures that enable that to happen. We have, um, a, a, you know, a... a, a a social work academia in Scotland that um, is is producing um, lots of research, um, but how do we connect all of that in to um, the the and turn it into good practice um, and reflect on it and review it and learn new things from it? So again, there are something about the positives of having national structures like a national social work agency that that enable. The, the, if you like, the, the collation of that, but also learning about the knowledge of the gaps 
um, areas that are not being researched that maybe are not popular and then we can seek out um, individuals or um, you know other other university departments who have special you know specialist expertise in those areas can I bring in Siobhan questions about how we can ensure the research is uh, an uh, a integral part of what people do. So if you look at the career development framework, for example, the NEST developed, the very much talks about the clinical uh, training, leadership and research elements of the work of HPs and nurses. Uh, I think what we're trying to do in the NHS at the moment is really to make sure that staff have a proper work plan, depending on their grade and their level of working, that would enable them uh, to do that, to be able to them to dedicate uh, time to research. If those staff, however, have moved into the national care system, where there is maybe different thinking, different culture, does not this framework exist? Then you know there is danger that that uh, will not be maintained. Thank you, and uh, Sandesh, I can move on. Emma. Thanks, convener. Just to pick up on the issue of research and training, right, Miss clinical nurse educator. That was my, my career for many years. But the, the, the very fact that research and training is in the bill, and the research part says that, uh, that the Scottish ministers and care boards may do any of the following in relation to research relevant to the services, but it's assist others in conducting research and give financial assistance to, in relation to it. So this would enable further legislation to basically say, Absolutely, we value research, we value training. Training leads to quality quality care improvements and then allows for career progression as well. So just back to this, Framework Bill will enable further research and training to be enabled as we move forward with this National Care Service. Not sure if, if it's a really a question or just a comment. Alison. Anyone want to respond? Um, I, again, I, I think what you're talking about um, is really important. Career pathways and options. We need people who will go into academia. We need people who will be practitioners. We need people to um, go into leadership and senior management positions. You know, and within practitioners, we need people to keep um, um, honing their skills. Um, we, they may become more specialists. They may um, develop particular sets of, sets of skills. Um, what we need, again, I think I've, said, I've mentioned Agenda for Change before, is some kind of framework, and we have the, the advanced practice framework that's being worked on um, by the Office of the Chief Social Work um, Advisor at the moment. So we need to um, pursue that, but I think we need to think about it not only, you know, so we've got teachers, we've got some of it in health, um, we should be working towards it from social work, and we think we need to replicate that across the professions, and we also then need to make sure that the professions can find it um, easy to perhaps to move professions at particular points in their professional lives. You know, we want people to come into this um, very, very broad sector and have um, um, healthy, thriving professional lives where they're feeling that they're able to do what they came in to the professions to do, but also to move around and experiment and develop their, their, their skill set. Okay. Colin, oh. wanted to come in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. But I, I think the thing for me is around about is that funding being available for it and it being absolutely um, ring-fenced, if you like. And I think the issues around about the, within social care is looking at uh, multi-professional research. And I think it's around about how we look at opportunities to do that. It's not about just about uni-professional research. It's around about that multi-professional element of it. And that t it's actually, it leads to the integration that we've been talking about. And just a final point is we have National Education for Scotland, so NES and Health Improvement Scotland. We've now got Public Health Scotland. These are bodies that, you know, um, National Health Service workforce um, look to for advice and that. So this, again, could enable um, our National Care Service workforce to tap into expertise in NES, HIS and Public Health Scotland would would that would be something that we could reasonably assume as a, a potential body that would help support education and research in this National Care Service. Is that correct? Millie? Yeah, yeah, we, we uh, already work closely with NES, and I know that they certainly see that integrated approach across health and social care as being very important. OK, thanks. OK, thank you. Right, as, as build data, and Gillian Mackay. Thanks, convener. 
Um, despite the fact that we know there are significant gaps in social care data, there is no requirement for care boards to collect data or report on performance included in the bill. What data does the panel believe should be collected to inform social care reform and development of a national care service? I know that is how long is a piece of string style question, um, but thoughts on that would be greatly received. Kay, I think I'll yeah, come to you first. Thank you. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take a strand of that and hopefully colleagues can uh, fill in some other areas. So I suppose for me, uh, if I think about data collection, which is always problematic, mm -hmm. uh, in the health and social care world, we don't necessarily talk the same language mm -hmm. and that makes things tricky. So I might talk about turnover and somebody, somebody in health will have a different terminology for it. But, it, but in the social care world, what, what always makes me a little irritated is people talk about your vacancy rates and what, how many vacancies are there in social care. And, and they don't at the same time talk about unmet need. Yeah. Because you know, in terms of vacancy rates, it's a bit of how long is a piece of string. It actually depends on, on you know, what is required to be delivered. And, and uh, in, in the social care world, also about... Um, the, the state of your providers in the area and who's able to, to do what. So mm -hmm. it, it'd be good to get a, a, a common approach to language, um, maybe something that makes data gathering a bit more straightforward mm -hmm. so we can share data in a, in a more effective way. And um, just understanding what the data is all for. So in, in workforce planning terms, for example, you can gather a lot of data, but are you looking at it and are you interrogating it in a, in a way that is meaningful mm -hmm. in order to get the right outcomes? Colin? Yeah, I agree with that. It's around about having the, that shared understanding and the shared data. We, we lack a lot of data mm -hmm. that's not available in social care. Well, it is available, we just don't gather it. Yeah. And the other thing is around about systems to gather data, um, especially with the raft of employers who are involved. Mm -hmm. We need to make it easy for employers to be able to input that data so that we can use it and interrogate it to make sure that we're developing services that meet the needs of the individuals we're providing care, but also the workforce. Mm -hmm. And that data is, um, well, it's missing as we speak. Yes. Maybe. Uh, yeah, we, we are um, a national system statistics provider and our workforce data reports, which we have been publishing for I think over 10 years now, um, are cited regularly in all, all of the um, documentation surrounding um, the creation of the National Care Service. So th there is data there about the workforce, um, but I think that point about what's missing, um, going back to what you were saying, Kay, it, linking it to outcomes, I think can be very difficult and certainly work needs to be done around thinking about how you do that. Yeah, Alison. I think early on we need to decide what's important and what we're going to measure and mm -hmm. why we're going to measure it. Um, that then leads to kind of data sets and, and standard ways of doing that. Um, remembering that data drives what we do. You know, we, we know what happens mm -hmm. um, or the issues that can happen, should we say, with waiting lists, um, times, and, you know, it, it really drives how we manage what we, what we do. So we need to be careful. Um, we've mentioned a couple of times collecting unmet need. Um, I mean, this is an area in social work at the moment that simply isn't collected. Mm -hmm. If somebody um, presents but is nowhere near what we would say the eligibility thresholds are at the moment, we effectively, we might signpost, but effectively we say go away until you're worse. Mm -hmm. Okay, come yeah. back when you're worse. Um, so there's something um, about, and, and there will be no main note made of that, there is no data and systems that collect yes. that, um, might collect that there's been an interaction, but we're not collating that, that kind of level of need. And of course, when resources have been scarce and eligibility has been going higher. So one of the first things, actually, a, a National Social Work um, Service needs to do is really understand the... the um, the early support that people need and the, the level of preventative early services that we, we should be aiming mm -hmm. to get in. And if, 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 as a society, we decide we can't afford that, you know, we need to look at resource, Abs absolutely, let's not be naive. But that then that becomes a political and social decision, um, but that we know what we're dealing with. And that, I think that's the, the, the tricky bit at the moment. Julian, Thanks. Um, Obviously, we have anticipatory care planning to, to a certain extent in, in places and we heard at Granite City Care how they're moving towards an outcome focused, they're using an outcome focused model rather than collecting data for when people clock out, people clock in and out because that's 
very binary and doesn't actually give a flavour of the of the service that's being delivered. How how do you see anticipatory social care planning as well as anticipatory health care planning feeding into an outcomes focused model? I'm assuming the panel would like to see a move um, towards more outcomes focused models rather than the sort of the sort of time and task. But if I'm incorrect on that, you can you can correct me there. Maybe go to Alison first. <laughs> you, 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 you're very correct. And as I, I've said before, I think, um, you know, outcomes, um, trying to get to outcomes is is not a new thing. We have no. been trying, we mm -hmm. have been aiming for this for a long time. But I think, again, it's it's some of the, the structures that we have that stop us working perhaps yeah. as full um, interdisciplinary teams. Um, maybe uh, we're not working perhaps as locally as we could do. We're not as accessible to people, so that that um, and 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 that it has not. You know, people don't come and chat on the social work department's door anymore. You know, um, um, and there are many different doors perhaps that one has to chat on to find to find the right door. So the notion of a, a kind of a single point, single points of contact are really important, but also making those local where you know, begin to know people's faces, you know where um, the integrated teams are in your local community, where they can be found, and that there is a level of trust that those teams are working for the, for the community to, to strengthen and build and, and, and catch people um, who may fall through gaps. Thank you. Stephanie, you had a question on this. Thank you very much, convener. Back again. Um, I think you're absolutely spot on, Alison. And we all know that data drives what we do. So the data we collect is, is hugely, hugely, hugely important there. Um, interested as well, too, in um, when we're looking at outcomes, quite often it's the voices of professionals that are right up there. Um, and I'm quite interested as well in any comments that you have about how we can make sure that we also keep the, the voices of those that are receiving care and receiving services because sometimes their, their view of the situation can be a wee bit different there. So about having that parity, any comments around that? Thanks. Absolutely happy, happy to um, comment on that. Um, I think... I think there's a few points there. Certainly what social workers go into social work to do and be trained to do, their essence is around human dignity, human rights, social justice, hearing people who are not otherwise heard. That is, that is our, very, our very essence. However, what happens when we get out into practice is that um, there are mechanisms that then either don't enable options to be fully um, explored or fully delivered or resource issues that mean um, that there, there are problems. Um, very, I mean, it's, it's always concerning to hear that the voice of somebody using services may not be heard. Um, we would view ourselves as an advocacy um, profession, very much wanting to stand alongside people who need services. Um, and um, I, I think, again, what we need to do moving towards national care services is ensure that frontline professionals are empowered to, to do that advocacy properly. And that goes back to some of the things that we've talked about, which is about um, professional parity, um, which is about not having assessments kind of rejigged because um, then it will re reach certain, uh, a lower resourcing requirement or you know, some of the things that happen. I think we need to be honest. Um, um, one of the other things that can happen, and certainly that social workers, I suppose it, it's part of our bread and butter, is where the views of people and their carers and their family may be different. Mm -hmm. And that there is a role for us in um, how we support people to work that through, negotiate that, and how we, we, we seek a way through um, the hum human rights issues that appear because we are creatures who live in families and communities. Um, so we, you know, we're not we're not islands, um, and so our human rights impact on those around us. And that um, I think what we need to always ensure that we're doing is being having clarity about um, where those rights rub up against each other um, in in families, but also and where there are there are protection issues, child protection, and adult support protection issues. There are, there are often times where it, it, it does, bottom line is it does feel to people 
that their views may not be taken fully on board, but also the profession of social work is about trying to enable people to work through that and have the, the, the least damaging experience of sometimes what is very crisis-driven um, um, work. Cohen? It's, it's, it's making sure that the, the voice is heard at every level. So that's from commissioning, but it's also around about that when the, the care and intervention's been planned, that individuals are involved in it. But as importantly, as I, I, when care's been delivered, that we actually get the reflection from the individual who's received the care, and that's recorded and it's fed back. And it comes back to this data. If you actually started to yeah. take these responses, you can then build how effective your services are. Thank you. And that good note to end on. So I want to thank all our panellists this morning for the time and what they've told us. I'm going to suspend the meeting for 10 minutes till our change of round panel.
We now move on to our second evidence session, which comprises representatives from trade unions, and uh, they, which represent the social care workforce. And I welcome to the committee um, Mary Alexander, Deputy Regional Secretary for Unite, Tracy Dowling, the Regional Secretary for Unison Scotland, Ros Foyer, the General Secretary for the STUC, and Cara Stevenson, the organiser for the Women's Campaign Unit of GMB Scotland. And welcome to you all. Thank you for coming along to speak to us about the National Care Service. I'm going to take things back to the, the review, Derek Feely's uh, review, and the recommendations that were made in that review. Do you see this framework bill as being the springboard to realising the recommendations of the, the, the so-called Feely review? And I'll maybe go around everyone, first of all, to get your, your views on that before I allow colleagues to come in. So I'll maybe go to Cara, first of all. Yep, thank you. Um, I think that looking at reforming uh, the social care sector, following off the back of the, the Feely review, um, you know, is welcomed. And I think that, you know, great things could be done with social care if it's done properly. Um, however, right now, um, the bill is not, it's not prescriptive enough to give reassurances to the social care workforce. Um, social care staff right now are being asked to take a leap of faith into what the Scottish Government are trying to do around about the National Care Service. Um, they need to be given more information. Um, you know, that there has to be more to the bill um, that gives that gives the workforce um, faith that this is going to work. So you don't agree with the, the idea of a co-design process that's going to inform the secondary legislation that's going to provide that detail? Is that something you would rather that the bill had, was completely prescriptive of everything and do away with the co-design process? Or do you agree that maybe this way of doing things actually means a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down one? No, definitely. We agree with a co-design process and we, you know, we welcome that. We think it's really important that um, people with lived experience and the workforce are involved in that. However, um, you know, when questions have been asked at present, everything seems to be answered with its subject to co-design. Um, and trying to get the workforce, the workforce on board with that when there's not a lot of information to go on. You know, we're struggling to get the workforce involved when everything that they're asking is, what does this mean for my future? What does it mean for my career? Am I going to be able to feed my kids? Is my employer going to change? And every answer to that question right now is, it's subject to co-design. So we're asking them to take a leap of faith into co-designing something that there's no other answers around just now. And okay. that's where that's where we're, we're having issues. There has, to be, there has to be more in the bill Yes, we welcome co-design, you know, for the intricate details, but, you know, it's a very, very wide framework. So when you say there has to be more in the bill specifically, what do you want to see in the framework bill that wouldn't be part of the co-design, that would be in well, statute already well, without I mean, I that co-design? I think really, you know... For instance, you know, collective bargaining is, is a big thing for us um, to ensure that the workforce are, are represented. We don't think that, you know, there would have to be a kind of a co-design around that. The workforce should be represented. There's fair work. Um, we, we wouldn't see the workforce, you know, saying they don't want that. Um, so there's lots of things that could enhance social care now rather than it being co-designed with a bill, something that trade unions have been bringing um, to the forefront of the, you know, the issues that staff have at present. Things could be changed now. Okay. Mary Alexander, Feely, does the bill, the framework bill provide, you don't have to press your microphone, we're done for you. Um, does the, the, the aspirations and recommendations of the Feely report, the framework, does it at least provide a springboard for them as, as it's written? I, I think the Feely uh, review has, or, or report has, a, you know, a number of very positive elements in it and there was wide-ranging consultation with Feely. However, you know, we're disappointed from the point of view that it retains mixed provision of care services and our, our position as a union is that the National Care Service should be publicly owned and run 
and universal and free at the point of, of need, and that's our position. Um, the, you know, there are uh, a number of recommendations in Feely, such as um, adopting the Fair Work and Social Care Group inquiry recommendations, which, um, you know, is, is very positive. However, there is a lot of frustration, uh, as Cara has indicated, uh, among the workforce about the, the amount of talking that's been done around, uh, you know, what needs to change in care, what is the position of the workers, because there was quite an extensive inquiry the Fair Work Convention undertook. Now, that started in 19... In 2017, not 1917. Um, feels kind of like it. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so, and we're coming up for five years. The report's recommendations came out in February 2019. And then Feely in 2021 uh, said, look, let's, let's adopt these. And, and that echoes a lot of what we are saying around sectoral bargaining, you know, having a minimum terms and conditions changing the you know, commission and procurement process. Um, so it's very frustrating to, you know, we seem to have, there's a lot of talking going on and has been going on over the last five years. And from the, our members' point of view, they're just, you know, frustrated beyond, uh, you know, beyond belief about nothing concrete happening that, that's changing, you know, what's happening in their day-to-day -day job role. So there's issues, you know, for example, Edinburgh, there's a 20% uh, shortage of staffing there. Um, and, you know, we regularly get calls into our office from people saying, I, you know, I, I, I've had enough, I can't cope anymore, you know. Um, it's really difficult, we're not getting, you know, the support and supervision that we need um, we're not getting the training that's necessary to deal with people, for example, with mental health health problems or learning um, issues, uh, for, for example. So there's an awful lot of frustration out there. Uh, the mileage issue is a really a big problem um, because people are now saying, look, we can't afford to take our cars to work. Mm. It, you know, it's not cost effective. Why is it that NHS staff there's a temporary arrangement, an increase in mileage rates applied to them, but it doesn't happen to us. And, you know, they are really feeling extremely undervalued. And given everything that they've done during the pandemic, uh, you know, to keep vulnerable people safe, um, they're, they're just very disheartened. And they want immediate action, which is what's, uh, you know, highlighted with the, the briefing that the STUC have produced, those immediate demands, because we absolutely need them. There is a huge crisis. And, you know, if you look at, for example, places like Aldi that are paying £10.50 an hour, you know, a, a lot of people are leaving because, frankly, it, it's not so emotionally draining. It's, it's a better job. You don't have to worry about what happens when you leave, you know, the uh, the vulnerable service user yeah. and you haven't got enough time okay. to deal with it. My, my, my colleagues will probably dig into the, some of the detail of that. And we, we do want to keep it to the scrutiny of the bill. And, and, and these issues are very important and, and, and obviously inform what the National Care Service is, start, is, is, is hoping to achieve. But we do have to keep bringing it back. And I will keep on bringing you back to the bill that's in front of us because that's where we've got to make our recommendations uh, informed by yourselves. Tracy, can I ask you about my initial question about Feely? Well, the focus of the Fair Work and Social Care Inquiry had a, a large chunk of it about improving the quality of the work in contracted social care. And I don't think the bill sets out how it's going to improve the quality of work in contracted out social care. I mean, poor quality jobs leave you with poor quality care would be, would be my summary of that. And as much as the bill talks about ethical commissioning, but like the point that Cara was making, they're very warm words, very welcome words, but I've absolutely no idea what it's going to mean in practice. So your answer to your question is, do you want us to be prescriptive or do you want a framework? It's probably somewhere in between. Ideally, we'd want you to be prescriptive about all the things we want and perhaps more of a framework for perhaps some of the others. But the real core of this is about the ethical commissioning. If you're going to create these boards and they're going to commission services, what does that mean for the staff? 
And at the moment, that means that the staff could be contracted out, hired out on a contract-by-contract -contract basis, moved from one employer to another, never in a stable environment at all. I'm quite sure you'll probably want to uh, speak to your local government colleagues about the workforce issues that we've given evidence uh, to there about retaining a quality trained workforce under the fair work principles. And that's where the prescription needs to be because all of those those fair work principles that we've worked so hard to achieve jointly need to be embedded into this bill. But that contractual aspect that you just talked about, that's a question, presumably, that you have around this because it's not explicit in the bill, but still questions around that. Oh, huge questions yeah. around it. I mean, we would say don't do it. Um, we don't think you need to under embark upon huge structural reform in order to get some improvements around fair work and the and the workforce engagement. I mean, if we take the um, the sick pay issues that existed throughout COVID, the Scottish government, you know, intervened and put in place a really robust system to look after the health of workers so they could take time out when they were ill and then return to the workforce. You did all of that without creating a bill. There are there are lots of things you can do. But there was emergency legislation in place for that. So, I mean, my understanding is that with having ministerial responsibility, that's when the Scottish Government could step in. For example, when there's a situation where there's a provider that fails mm -hmm. or standards yeah, fail. And, and I've had this explanation before from one of your colleagues around that. If all you need to do when there's systemic failures is intervene. You can do that without creating care boards and everything else that goes with it. You've done it before, you'll do it again. Happened in my local area where um, there was failures with the home care provision and the council stepped in mm. at huge cost. And we've had the examples in some of our rural communities where it's cost a huge amount of money to buy mm. a care facility off so a private contractor. So you don't believe contractor. that the Scottish Government should have, should be stepping in. I do believe you will have to step in at times where there is some kind of failure. What I don't believe is that you need to create the National Care Service in its in this framework in order to do that. You as a government will always step in when you feel that there is a, a need to. Um, where there have been crises, you've done it before without any of this. So I'm not sure what the step change mm. is if it's for emergency. Because the inference is it's not for an emergency. But let me take you it's back to the pandemic. Where far more routine than that, and that's why you're putting it within uh -huh. the bill. But let me take you back to the pandemic where there were failures, for example, in some of the standards that were being deployed in, in, in care homes. And the government had to have COVID legislation to step in. At the moment, we don't have... The government doesn't have the ability to step in, as you suggested. You, you said that local authorities have stepped in, but the government, that's part... Now my understanding of, of some of the provisions in the bill is to give ministers the ability, the National Care Service, to step in. OK. On an emergency basis, yes. that's fine. But that's just one component part of this entire bill. Mm -hmm. Um, and the rest of it just leads yeah. to a huge range of questions. But that was the bit that I wanted to focus on. Yeah, that, that, okay. That's fine. Can I, can I come to, to, to Ross Foyer? Yep. Uh, you asked whether you, we think this bill will meet uh, the, the requirements of, of Feely. Yeah. Um, Feely talked about if we want a different set of results, we need a different system. Um, and, and the short answer to your question is no, this bill doesn't deliver the changes that, that are really required. If we really want a truly transformative national care service, which is, you know, something that all of us here support, do we think this bill is the right vehicle to deliver that? I'm afraid not. Uh, what we feel is that this bill could end up costing an awful lot of money for the Scottish Government at a time when that money could be better used to deal with a system that is in crisis in a much more immediate way. And... We, we would like to see the, the grave concerns that we have around areas that are missing in this bill because it does... Co-design is a great concept, but you do need some key driving principles that we feel are missing from the bill. So there is no uh, mention of, of collective bargaining and what that process would look like and how we take that forward. We've been waiting years now to see that taken forward appropriately. 
Uh, we need to see the profiteering aspects. There's nothing done to transform the fact that we still have profiteering happening in our care system. And if you're serious about setting up a national care service that's going to change things, we have to address the fact that up to almost 30% of a uh, fees paid into care uh, in, some, in, in some of our more profitable care homes uh, are, are going out the door, uh, not getting used on the service. If you look at not-for-profit parts of care services compared to privatised parts of care services, that's closer to 3% uh, that's not spent on delivery of the service itself. So that's a huge leakage of funding that in the state our economy is in. We can ill afford not to address that issue. Um, and also, we need to address the issue of local accountability. It doesn't work at the moment through the joint integrated boards and, and the way that, that those are set up at the moment. There is a democratic deficit in how we're delivering care. We need to make it better. And our fear is that actually, with, with the sort of commissioning system that's been set up, it won't address uh, in a way that, that gives us any surety. Uh, the fair work issues and the collective bargaining issues will take that forward. It won't address the fact that we still have profiteers sucking profits out of our care system, and it won't address that local accountability. So those, those are a number of issues that you think should be in this framework bill, straight off, informed by the work of the Fair Work conv Convention? Absolutely. Uh, for this bill to be fit for purpose and worth spending the money on, we need to see that we're actually getting something out of it because there are far too many immediate issues that need to be addressed with workforce and provision out there. Uh, you know, really critical issues uh, for us to be justifying going down this path. Right now, we want to see the bill withdrawn in its current form. Emma, and then I'll come to Sandesh. Thanks, uh, Kavira. Um, I was going to, it's still good morning. Um, just to pick up, Ros, on the point about collective bargaining, um, um, I'm reading a document in front of me, February 21, from the Scottish Government that says the Scottish Government has made a clear commitment to promote collective bargaining through the inclusion of an employee voice indicator measured by collective bargaining coverage within the national performance framework and will work in partnership with the STUC to achieve increased coverage. So there is already the intention to do that. It's part of what's been uh, moved forward. So if that's already taking place elsewhere within the government's uh, processes, um, I'm interested, you, you, you think that the, it, the actual language needs to be in the bill rather than using a co-designed approach in statutory legislation down the line to basically embed that um, as the government has actually, looks like, already taken it forward? The government has made a commitment to widening out collective bargaining more generally, and I, I would actually like to give my colleagues an opportunity to answer some of the detail in this because they've been in the room uh, representing their members, you know, in some of these discussions. But what we're saying is, yes, we absolutely would like to see more explicit reference to a sectoral bargaining framework uh, within this bill, a very explicit commitment uh, to that being there. Uh, I don't think that what you read out to me goes far enough, frankly. It, it, it commits the government to the principle of extending collective bargaining, but it doesn't clearly say that as part of a national care service, we will have national pain conditions bargaining, we'll have a, a, a collective bargaining framework in there. And, and that's the sort of surety we need. But I, I would prefer to let my colleagues answer because we are the umbrella body. Yeah. They actually represent the members on the ground and they've but, been in the room involved in these talks. But a lot of employee law is, devo is reserved still to Westminster, so there's not certain aspects of employee law that can't be achieved in Scotland, but we have to look at what is doable in in. in in legislation in Scotland. Yeah, this is not about employee law. This is about leverage. Uh, at the end of the day, the, the Scottish Government contracts care. Uh, you spend an awful lot of money in contracting care services and you have every legal right to, to lay out that collective bargaining should be part of the process that you would expect contractors delivering care to uphold. Uh, certain collective bargaining principles. Um, that, I believe, has now been tested actually through the construction inquiry. Um, that adherence to collective bargaining is something that the Scottish Government could, 
could and should require uh, as part of their contracting process. Okay. Uh, can I move on to questions from Sandesh Gohani? Thank you. Uh, I have to say, I was a little surprised by the convener's remarks around COVID, mm -hmm. because in previous committee meetings, we heard that this bill would make no difference uh, to what happened in COVID. And, uh, and I believe that care homes closed themselves before Scottish Government told them to, because and patients were still being um, trying to be pushed in. So, Cara, I, I know that I'd like to just ask you a little bit more about that and to elaborate on what you were saying. And I'd also like to know from um, Tracy and Roz, both of your unions are calling for um, the bill to be stopped uh, and for uh, the crisis right now to be addressed. And I'd like to hear a little bit more uh, about your reasoning for that. So you want to go to Cara first of all, Sandra? Uh, Tracy first. Uh, Tracy. Um, sorry, you mentioned Cara's name. Uh, oh, sorry, no, but when, um, sorry, Tracy, when, when you were speaking about uh, just a little bit earlier, you were talking about how um, this, the emergency framework yeah. uh, is one part I, of it, and I'd like I, to just know a bit more. I obviously have no insight or knowledge into what organisations have said one thing or another. What I would say, in recognition to the work the Scottish Government did, was that during COVID, when things were at their deepest, darkest, worst, for many aspects of the workforce, there were measures <coughs> put in place with a through emergency legislation or otherwise. So, yes, they made a huge difference to people. I mean, very basic premise of if you're off sick with, with a dreadful virus that could kill you, the financial distress of not knowing if you can feed your family because you're not be able to access sick pay, or worse, you come back to work and therefore infect other people with it, uh, was alleviated somewhat you know, through that process. And it's, it's, for me, exemplar behaviour by a Scottish government that is able to do these kind of things. I don't think you need necessarily um, a huge structural reform in the context of, of a national care service in which to do that. Again, can I ask Cara uh, about um, the questions that I had about how um, you, you know, both the unions are looking at wanting to, to stop things right now and concentrate on the crisis that we have? Yep, um, thanks for that. I think, just to bring this into the point as well, I was actually a home carer in my local authority and worked all the way through the pandemic. Um, so the feelings I've got and the connection I've got with the workforce right now um, is something that I'm really keen to bring to the table to let everybody know. Um, <clears throat> obviously, at the moment, we feel that the bill is not fit for purpose. I'll not go back over that. I explained that at the very, very beginning. And the reason for that is we are dealing with a workforce, and I will try not to get emotional when I'm speaking about this, they are broken, they're exhausted, and the spotlight is now off them. The spotlight was on them at one point. You know, the care are doing great, they're out there, let's stand on a doorstep and clap. Now we're giving them a national care service bill that doesn't give them any sort of job security, any sort of value, and any sort of feeling of worth after the nightmare that they have just been through for the last two years. So we want reform, we want to make social care better, but we feel that what they're being offered right now is not good enough. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Paul? Convener, I just have a couple of questions. I wonder if I can return us to the way that the bill has come about. We've heard a lot about co-design after the, the framework's passed, and we've heard a lot about it being done through secondary regulations. Um, it, my sense across the, all of the contributions here today and more widely is that um, there are things that could be dealt with right now using existing powers about pay, terms and conditions, the recommendations in Philly uh, and the Fair Work Commission, um, and that actually it might have been better to sit down and co-design something in a meaningful way before we got to the legislative process. Would it be fair to say that's the position of trade union members and that's why there is this call now for a pause to the bill, that actually it would have been better to do the co-design up front to actually have a meaningful discussion about you know, what this is going to look like? Mary. In there, um, yeah, I think that's uh, you know that that's um, uh, a fair reflection of of you know how we feel. Um, there is a lot of discussion going on, um, but as I said earlier, that is causing an awful lot of frustration among uh, you know our, our members because of how long we've been talking about sectoral bargaining. For example, we have had numerous meetings, probably hundreds of meetings about, about sectoral bargaining. 
Um, and the point was raised earlier on regarding collective bargaining. Um, and that was in the national performance framework. But, you know, the Fair Work and Social Care Group recommendations are quite clear about, you know, the problems there is within social care and, and, and staffing and recruitment and retention issues. And it, it does call for a sector level body. And that was in 2019. So there's a lot of talking being done and, and it, it, it would be, you know, it, 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 something needs to happen now with it. Um, to, for, for people to feel more confident about, uh, you know, the bill because they just see there's not much detail around anything. For example, you know, the care boards, that's the, the proposed setting up of the care boards has just caused um, a lot of um, uncertainty, divisiveness, worry about what's going to happen to my job, what if we get transferred, what about the pension, what about the sectoral bargaining arrangements that there is... Um, so there's huge um, uncertainty with uh, the workforce, and that's on top of, as Cara said, you know, people suffering zero-hour contracts and you know working long hours um, and not getting paid for it, not getting breaks, etc. Tracy, yeah, can I just add to that that it's like buying a house but without ever having seen it. Um, we don't even know how many rooms are in it or, or where where it's located in in many respects. So you're absolutely right. I think some of this. The pressure, if you like, around doing this, doing it now, doing it in this way has come from not starting at an earlier stage in that level of engagement. And the fundamental for us is about the ethical commissioning. It's about 75,000 jobs going out of councils to somewhere. Um, whether that's in the same house or it's in a house next door in an estate up the road, we don't know. We just don't know. And in such a critical um, area of of the lives that we lead to have our social care workforce uncertain about who they work for, where they're going to be, um, I, I just think is is has all the hallmarks of, of, of this being a bit of a disaster at this stage. And we would absolutely say to you, if you won't withdraw the bill, please pause it, please engage at that much earlier stage, because that whole co-design needed to involve, had to involve us, even from a workforce issue, um, at a much, much earlier stage. We genuinely do not know what the future looks like for around 75,000, and that's council staff and then all of the social care staff that work for private contractors and what the future looks like for them. Well, Th thanks very much, Convener, and thanks for those uh, responses. I wonder if I can just come to something Ros said. Um, Ros, you spoke about democratic deficit. I think that it exists in the current system, the way it's set up. I mean, do you have concerns that the transfer of that decision-making, that power up to more of a national level, will, will it kind of increase and exacerbate that democratic deficit? And is it your kind of view that in democratising either IGBs or care boards, you know, there should be voting reps that come from trade union side or carers or, or patients with lived experience? Thank you, sir. Very valid questions. What we do know is we're not happy with the, with the current system because it seems to fall between a rock and a hard place and, and you know, there isn't the accountability that we would like to see currently. Uh, we don't want to see any further dilution of that. It's not necessarily a, a bad thing to have a set of national standards as part of a national care service, but it's also very important to have that local accountability and, and local democracy in terms of how these things are implemented in order to suit local areas. Um, and just to you know, say, I think your previous question kind of links into that, because what we need here is a bit of time to get this right. I actually think that you're, you're absolutely right. The co-design needs to happen now before we're expected to back a bill that we don't understand what it's actually going to deliver. Um, it's all jammed tomorrow. Um, and that's very difficult for uh, workers who are involved in delivering a service that's in crisis today, where they need immediate action. And we, I mean, we, we get a bit sick of the co-design thing because we've been talking about this for years. Workers have been at meeting after meeting, making it clear where, where the failures are. Ultimately, there needs to be more investment in, in the front line. And, and that's why, particularly at this time, where we've got huge workforce crisis, we've got a, a, a crisis coming this winter, 
um, you know, we actually wrote to the minister last week to say, look, could we, do, could we put this bill aside and, and not be putting budget money towards these huge structural changes now? Let's take more time to get it right. But right now, let's look at, you know, collective sectoral bargaining. Let's look at £15 an hour for qualified care workers. Let's look at sick pay. Let's look at getting a set of national standards in and a number of other asks, because these are the immediate things that are actually going to make a difference on the ground and create a workforce that are well trained and high quality. And that's exactly what we need uh, to be able to deliver this service sustainably. So, you know, it, it, it's not that we don't support a national care service. Nothing could be further from the truth, but we want to get the opportunity to get it right. Can, can I bring in a question from Tess White? Tess. Thank you, and I'm, I'm sorry for missing the first part. Um, just one question. So one of the things, we were in Aberdeen yesterday, Aberdeen City. One of the things that hit me this morning was this huge disparity, if you think about 61p a mile versus 45p a mile. And I know when you're looking at aligning terms and conditions, you've got huge issues on pensions, on sick pay, on all that sort of thing, which can be huge costs if you're aligning. But even something small, people will move because they can't afford to move around for 45p a mile. But if they were paid 61p a mile, so just, just a comment on, on that, which is tiny, but it's huge. You're absolutely right. And for some of our, our, of our members, there's a difference between whether they can go to work or not, whether they can afford to, to pay, to fill up the... the, the uh, whoa, jeez, I've just tipped coffee everywhere. Um, whether or not they can, they can afford to, um, to go to work or not. Um, and, sorry, Mary, I didn't do it deliberately, honestly. <laughs> She'll send you the bill. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, yes, but I think it's broader than that. If we look at the construct of this as it stands... There's a huge propensity for people to be contracted out. And the minute you do that, you see the terms. We, there's empirical evidence around this. You see the terms and conditions start to drop. So the pay rates go down, the mileage rates go down. Um, and there's then this internal market, and people will jump around. So there's no security. I'm really, really sorry. Um, um, there's no security around any of that for the future. But worse than that, I think, in relation to this bill, there's an equality impact assessment there about some of the service users' experiences in terms of the equality impact, but there's nothing there in terms of workforce. So gender, race and disability, we know, absolutely tend to be those areas where there are equality dimensions to this. We've seen it in Glasgow in equal pay. It's cost the council hundreds of millions of pounds by contracting people out and then having to bring them back in and the contrast with other workers in other areas. So I think there needs to be a full equality impact assessment done on this. It's linked to sectoral bargaining and some security and some levelling out that will exist there, but all of it needs to be invested. Um, there's no way that this could be done within the current cost envelope in terms of bringing all that together. So, I mean, even the set-up costs are eye-watering. If you add in some of the dimensions around that, if this starts to decline and we think it will by people going out to contractors about how we bring them back up because sure as fate that won't work it will have to come back in the examples are there thank you thank you can, can i uh, bring in james dornan james <laughs> we'll just unmute james's microphone broadcasting that would be super okay okay that's you usually people are trying usually people are trying to silence the microphone it's supposed to turn it on when i'm on the, I'd like to come back to Tracy. Uh, the analogy about the house, do you not think that this is more like an opportunity to purchase something and then design what it is when you're there, when you see the space, when you see where the opportunities are, and, and give you the opportunity to do things like the, the, the issue that was just talked about, about the 45, 61 pence per mile. Surely a national care service gives you an opportunity to work closer together and try and resolve some of the issues. Because I completely agree with you. I don't think that people are doing the same job in the same area should be getting different terms and conditions. I think there's got to be a long-term aim to make sure that there's a, a an equality of that. Now, it might not be there just now, but surely the opportunity when you're co-designing, and the Social Security Bill is maybe a good example of that, the co-design after the bill 
has has worked in that case, and why can't it work in this case? And that was to Tracy. Yeah. You wouldn't buy a house without a survey, would you? What if it's structurally... That's not what's happened here. That's well, not what's happened here. You either want to ask me a question or you don't, but my answer I, I do, is I that answer, I think right. that you wouldn't buy a house that you hadn't had surveyed and could have all sorts of structural faults, and then you need to trust the developer that comes in. And the problem we've got at the moment is there's so, such insufficient detail within this bill. How can we trust... You know, what this is going to look like in the longer term. We genuinely don't know. It leaves all sorts of chasms open. Now, while we'll agree on the outputs in terms of uh, you know, people being paid the same and the quality of care being broadly, you know, well, certainly what people need, but broadly uh, consistent, uh, and those providers being scrupulous, ethical, and commissioned properly, I think we might disagree about the means in which to get there because you've heard from all of us repeatedly, we don't think this bill is the way to do it. Mary wanted to come in. Yeah, um, I, what I would say um, around, it, you know, it, talking about the mileage and, and other inconsistencies in terms of terms and conditions, um, and the point you made about, you know, let's do the co-design now, We've had the Fair Work and Social Care Group, uh, you know, which met for 18 to 22 months, I think, and took evidence from all parts of uh, the social care workforce, um, in, including uh, the employers. So we ha we've got that evidence. We've also got the Feely uh, report and, and, you know, the wide range in consultations that was done then. So what I would say is that we knew what the problems were, we identified those problems. And so, you know, we, we've had all this time in between to look at a sector level body, which is the recommendation for the Fair Work and Social Care Group. And that hasn't happened. So, you know, co-design is then going over, you know, a lot of the stuff that we've already sat in numerous meetings and, and you know, gone through all the, the challenges and the issues. Um, on, on the procurement piece that, that Tracy mentions, um, I recently uh, co-chaired a construction inquiry and, um, you know, there's a number of recommendations that the Scottish Government can make um, that, you know, you know, Westminster can't interfere with, uh, uh, basically. So, for example, they could require in commissioning procurement an adherence to collective bargaining rates. Um, Already, the Scottish Government required anybody that gets public funding has to pay the living wage. So there's precedents there um, that we can, you know, work with and, and, and move on. Thanks. Thank you. Can I bring in Carol Mockin again online? Carol. Uh, thank you. Thank you, convener. I think um, my question may have been asked answer, but I just want to go back to Mary, if you don't mind, um, just to clarify that point about slick sexual collective bargaining, uh, sexual collective bargaining, um, you know, are, are there steps? So we're ready, you know, we know what the steps are to put that in place are. Um, and so if we wanted to embed it in the bill, um, you know, we want to get it done before then, but get it embedded in the bill, that would help us pro to progress the National Care Service, um, you know, in a, in a better way with the, with the staff, you know, is that what you're saying? Yes, I mean, if if uh, you look at some of the demands that that, uh, that were made in the STUC briefing, and indeed the un union demands, if you have sectoral bargaining, uh, you know, number one as a priority, you know, a lot of the other things like mileage payments um, and uh, fifteen pound an hour and things would fall into place because you've got you've got those sectoral bargaining arrangements there. Okay, thank you. Um, we are now moving on to questions from Emma Harper and about the workforce. Yes, yep. Thanks, convener. Um, so we've heard a lot already about, I, I suppose there's real challenges right now. Um, we know that there's some issues around recruitment and retention. One of the things that I've raised is about having a, a national approach to standards of training and education. You, do you think that that will help support um, 
basically saying that, you know, this is worthwhile as a career. It's a great way to, to help, you know, obviously look after people. We know that predominantly it's women that are the carers and often they are caring for other people at the same time. So do you think what's set out in the bill as far as um, training um, and standardisation of a, an approach is some is a way that we should move forward in order to support recruitment and retention. Tracy. It's a regulated workforce. All of those, if, if you like, dimensions are built into their registration that they are required to, un to be um, educated to a particular standard, have continuing professional development. So all of that is there. I don't think that necessarily needs to be um, the, the main focus. The big issue is that a lot of workers have to pay their own registration fees, so there's then a further financial burden. It's something that's just changed as part of the local government pay settlement, that the, the councils are going to pick the tab up on that. Our fear would be if they find themselves being moved, uh, you know, employer, that, that, that they might lose the ability to have those fees paid. But the fundamentals are around basic rates of pay. Um, it's just the ceiling is... Um, is unachievable and they're all stuck at rock bottom uh, for many, many, many of them. Competitor type employment in local areas. Most carers, you're right, working women, they live and work in their communities. It's the type of work they want to do in their communities. Um, and for the most part, they're happy to do it until a supermarket builds something new along the street and then the money's better. Um, and they just have to move. They have to move for where the money is and we need to do something about that. We firmly believe that sectoral bargaining is the key to that because it's not just about the basic pay, it's also about the mileage rates that you spoke about, pension uh, schemes. Uh, we're seriously worried about what NCS means for pensions um, in terms of transferring out large swathes of the workforce and then uh, perhaps the scheme being diminished for those that remain within it. But we have to put together a an attractive package of employment measures to make sure that we're the employer of choice for what is some of the most basic human rights and dignities that a lot of our members of our community deserve to have delivered in their own homes in some cases um, by people who really care about the work and are fully trained and engaged and registered to the appropriate standard. But that bit, if, I, if you think I've been critical about a lot of this, that bit's not bad in relation to the, the, the professional development side of things. I think the focus needs to be on, frankly, hard cash. So I wanted to come in, Emma. Can I bring Cara in? Yep. Um, yeah, so thanks for that. Um, profe Professionalisation is, is, you know, a big key ask for us um, around about this bill because care workers are professionals. Right now they're not treated as such and we welcome the change to for that to, you know, care workers to feel that they are valued and they are professional. Um, you know, a consistent training and development programme, again, would be welcome because, you know, from an equality point of view, it won't matter what area you're in, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, what kind of workplace you're in, you will be having access to the same training as everybody else doing the same job. So that is definitely something that, you know, we would welcome. Again, though, the Triple S C, you know, ask you to be trained to a certain standard and we would expect that the, the, the fees would be covered by by employers. Um I think as well one of the big things is is that we have to move care on professionally. So society still have a perception of care workers going in, dusting the fireplace and sitting down having a cup of tea and speaking to somebody. Care has evolved so much from that but society's perception is no evolved with it. And I think we offer training and making this career a, a professional career. Um, we would have a great opportunity to, to you know, explain to society that, that that's how, that's the route we're going down. This is a professional career. We want to recruit, we want to retain, and we want people to be proud that they work in social care. Okay, so Ros, Ros wanted to come in, Emma, before I come back to you. Okay. Ros? Yeah, just one, one final uh, thing, you know, in that package of measures that we're asking for that makes the employment worthwhile, that's 
important is, is also just the, the care package, the timings of it and, and the cuts that have taken place to care packages for care at home. Uh, that's something we've asked to be addressed urgently because that's about the job experience. So, you know, we've got people who are trained to a professional standard, but they don't feel they're able to exercise their role to an appropriate standard given the resource constraints that they're working within. And I think that has to be understood is also part of the you know part of it is about money and the job the work being sustainable and not having to pay to work as some of our mm. members do find themselves having to do at the moment but part of it is also feeling that you can actually do a job for the people that you're trying to do a job for and some of these care packages have been cut back to the bone uh, and that is not a satisfying job experience for our members when they don't feel that they're able to give the appropriate level of care that they should be given. Um, so I think that that needs to be seen. You know, that's also been one of our asks to the Minister, as well as the pay and conditions side of it. They actually need to be funded to an appropriate level to be able to do a decent job for mm -hmm. the people they care for. Okay, thank you. Emma, back to you. Thanks, thanks, Convener, and thanks for your answers. Um, my understanding is there's 1,200 different care providers in Scotland. So this bill would propose to have them basically meeting a criteria for providing whether it, it whether it's salary whether it's education career pathways that whole approach so that you could work in the Fries and Galloway or the Scottish borders because your I suppose your career pathway training that you have achieved would be then transferable no matter where you go so my understanding is that the bill does propose to include the provision of training um, and even fund it as well. So it, is that not a good thing to have the 1,200 care providers, uh, you know, meet certain criteria that's then equivalent and measurable so that then we know that the value of the care, the care that's been provided and the carers is valued? I, I think... Yes, it's the enforcement of that. Um, and I think some of the contracts for the work and therefore the staff that will populate that need to be crystal clear that it's based on fair work. It's one of the things that, the, that has come out of, of the Feely inquiry is this that, that fair work should be the, the hallmark of an exemplar employer. And I'm, I am on very safe ground in saying that of those 1,200, they are not all exemplar employers. In fact, many of them, I wouldn't send to the shop with a list, to be honest, um, far less provide care in a local area. So I think if there's going to be ministerial oversight of this, I think there is currently uh, local, local oversight within councils um, and certainly within the, the, the IGIBs, that that has to be at the very, very heart of this, that it's one thing saying what you're going to do, and it's one thing being monitored to ensure that you do, and that there are consequences if you don't. So if you don't pay the Scottish living wage, you should not be in a position to, to you know, bid for a contract and have that awarded to you. Mm -hmm. It just should be out the question. You are out of the market as such. So I think we need to be very, very careful going forward particularly if we do end up with a um, very much a commissioning and procurement environment around care, that we don't see further erosions um, of, the, of the, the provisions within the contracts. Okay. Mary Alexander wants to come in, Emma. Mary? Yeah. I, I, I think, um, going back to your question, yes, it is positive that, you know, there, there will be, you know, training standards across the piece. Um, because that's one thing that you know our, our members tell us is sadly lacking at the moment with the staffing shortages. They're missing out um, quite a bit on uh, training, and, and it does need to be better. Um, from a fair work point of view, um, the problem that um, you, you know we have is always the evidencing of uh, those standards, and, and I think there's a lot to be done in the fair work space around, um, you know, if someone's bidding for a contract, then they need to provide, you know, the evidence that they are a fair work employer. What does that look like? You know, do they have union recognition? 
Um, there's monitoring as well, which uh, frequently doesn't happen, which really needs to happen. So, you know, are these providers matching up to what they say, uh, you know, that they're doing? And are they complying? And if they're not, then there should be consequences, as, as Tracy said, and we should be, you know, putting in place that evidence, that monitoring, that compliance as part of the uh, commissioning and procurement process so that if they're, you know, not good, then they shouldn't be in the game, they should be removed. Um, and that is, is something that's sadly lacking at the moment, generally in, in procurement. Can I come to Cara and then I'll bring in Ros? Just um, wanted to add on that. I agree with my colleagues, you know, as I've already stated as well, training development, totally welcome. Um, it, there does have to be regulation around that to ensure that everybody is re receiving the same standard and consequences if they are not. Um, I think one of, one of the big issues that's, that's happening in social care right now, which is something that, that we believe should be put in the bill as well, is obviously around agency staff. Um, so there's, you know, 1,200 employers, but there's also agency staff, which a lot of our workforce are actually leaving to go and work for at the moment because they're getting £10.50 an hour working in a care home or they're getting £20 an hour if they go and work for an agency. It's a no-brainer and a cost-of-living crisis. But they have to be brought into that kind of a training and regulation as well because the staff, the permanent staff that are on the ground, when they have five agency staff showing up to help them with one shift. They have to be trained to that standard as well, so it doesn't fall back on the permanent staff to pick up the, the kind of a more complex needs. Yeah. Ros? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, you talk about the number of different providers and the standards, and is that is that not a good thing? Of course it's a good thing, but that's where we still have grave concerns about the profit element being still part of this framework in this bill because when we did our uh, STUC research earlier in the year profiting from care, our report showed that staffing resources are 20% worse in private sector uh, providers in older people's care homes uh, compared to not-for-profit uh, older people's care homes. And that's a stark difference in the level of resource and service being provided. So we have to look at those things, but I think we also have to address the fact that it's not a surprising difference, given that we're talking about some organisations who are taking and making profits and diverting them out uh, from the service. So, you know, standards need to cover levels of resource that are actually being put into the care and the quality, uh, as well as things like training standards, pay conditions. Emma, um, I see you doing this. A wee short one, wee short one directed at somebody, okay. and then I have to move on to, to Gillian. All right. So I'm doing my teacher stare okay. again. So on the face of the bill, it says the National Care Service is to be an exemplar in its approach to fair work for the people who work for it and on its behalf, ensuring that they are recognised and valued for the critically important work they do. So that's on the face of the bill. So that's what we can build on. Again, this is a framework bill. And, and I'm saying, do you agree that it's actually really a good idea to have fair work, this approach, right on the face of the bill? And I'm going to go to Ross because Ross is nodding. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely agree that fair work has to be at the absolute heart of the delivery of this service. Uh, the trouble with terms like fair, fair work, the wellbeing economy, just transition, is they, they sound great. What we have to do is we have to drill right down and start to define much more clearly what we mean by fair work, because sadly, fair work, uh, even when we look at different public sector commissioning bodies means a different thing to one mm. government department or body than it does to another. And that can make a huge difference uh, to workers on the ground. You know, we really need to be much clearer in how are we implementing fair work and how are we evaluating it and how are we enforcing it. And there is much further that Scottish government can now go, as has been uh, proven in recent fair work uh, convention inquiries in their commissioning process to really batten down some very clear benchmarks that we require uh, when we talk about fair work. But yes, it has to be at the heart of it. I think we need more assurance of what do we mean by that, because it all sounds lovely. I want to see what it's actually going to look like. Thank you. Gillian. Uh, Thanks, convener. I want to come back to something that had been touched on by, I think, both Tracy and Mary um, 
earlier on. We obviously know that adherence to fair work principles by employers um, should be monitored. Um, as social care employers don't always uphold their responsibilities to their staff. In your opinions, how could the bill be strengthened with regards to oversight and regulation? And what, if any, specific provisions would you like to see included in the bill, either in terms of uh, strengthening oversight or in terms of those consequences for employers who don't uphold their end of the bargain? I'll maybe come to Tracy first and is okay. uh, started with this. I mean, the whole principle about fair work cascades through ministerial mm -hmm. duties, standards for commissioning and procurement. So I think, number one, I'm just going to play it back to you and that uh, ministers will have a specific duty to ensure that they're exemplars of fair work. If you've got sign off on commissioning and procurement and unfair work persists, it's been authorised by Scottish ministers. So there's a responsibility on all of us, I think, around that. The monitoring and the reporting on employment practices has got to be key to this, exactly who is doing what and where and when and why. A number of years ago, when Scottish living wage was part of the, the, the pay bargaining, Scottish Government funded it. I had a social care employer in the area that I lived that just refused to pay it. I mean, they were getting the money from elsewhere. Mm. Now, the Council stepped in and took the contract off them. It's an example, I think, of what you were talking about earlier. Now, we need more of that. When we identify that, whether it is on a, um, on a local level or it's you know, it's endemic throughout, then I think that there needs to be some steps and some scrutiny. And I've already mentioned it. I think there needs to be some penalties here mm -hmm. that, frankly, if you breach the ethical commissioning and tendering and procurement process, you should never be allowed to darken the social care door again uh, unless you can go away and, I don't know, rehabilitate yourself and come back and show that you can do it fairly and squarely. That there's no place for some of these practices in care. They have a huge impact on the workforce and therefore have a huge impact on the, on the, the recipients of the care. Um, so I think that's what needs to happen. Um, uh, ethical commissioning strategies within the care board strategic plans mm -hmm. absolutely need to, to be as robust and transparent as possible. Great, thank you. Gillian, any, any more for a move on? No? No, I think I'm okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Paul, transfer uh, functions and staff. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, I think in the initial questions, we've started to touch on many of these issues about transfer of staff and the concerns I think trade unions have around that 75,000 number and, and the potential knock-on. So I think what I will do is just try and focus, if I can, maybe on... Uh, your involvement in, in understanding that process, particularly around TUPE, for example. Um, so I wonder if I can just start by asking, when were trade unions consulted on um, the sense that there would be a transfer and that might involve a TUPE process um, by the government in terms of the bill? Now, Paul, if that's an invitation. OK. Um, <coughs> because until now, no. Um, it's very difficult to start that consultation process when you don't know what the final destination is going to be. So we know that if the tendering process results in, I don't know, adult social care, residential homes in the Lothians um, is going to be run by a and other employer, on a particular date we can start that process. But we've no idea at this stage exactly what the implications are. Our fear is... 75,000 staff will end up working for care boards. 75,000 staff may also be contracted on a hired out basis to deliver social care for that care board, potentially to other employers. And we'll see one TUPE transfer leading to another TUPE transfer leading to another. And at no point do you take your pension with you. Um, TUPE doesn't cover pensions. So it's just your bare terms and conditions that we will see eroded over time. But there has been no formal consultation uh, with us over the transfer of 75,000 staff to a care board. So, so just, just, just. Mary, Mary wanted to be sure. Of course, of course, of course. Question. Thank you. Yeah, um, as Tracy said, there hasn't been a formal uh, consultation, and it has been suggested that that might not happen. It may or may not happen. 
However, you know, that's, uh, you know, a huge uncertainty for, you know, for our members. And um, I think there has been discussions with, with COSLA, and, and you will have seen that we, uh, the unions put a press release out with COSLA calling for the reversal, uh, you know, of that provision. For all the reasons that Tracy's outlined, you know, the fears that staff have, you know, the potential bounce from, you know, care board to, to you know, somewhere else and then back again. And the pension provision is 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 lost um, because it's not covered, as Tracy says, by, by 2P. So it's huge um, for us and, and the number of people that's affected by it. And we really think that, you know, the money that has been spent on the National Care Service should just now go into... Um, local authorities and try and sort out some of the crisis that we've got um, in, in, in that sector rather than proceed with this uncertainty which we don't really know uh, that much about. Cara wanted to come in before I come back to you Paul. Um, yep so basically the same as, as all my colleagues here we, we've been told there's kind of a no formal we've not been told anything formal as yet what we have been said is, um, by the Minister is there is no intention of doing this in this bill, but of course it could be subject to co-design when we get there. Um, therefore, again, it just kind of reiterates the point of the bill that you know when there's nothing solid, people then start making their, their, their own assumptions. Um, and actually, you know, a good example of that was, was actually on a meeting yesterday with a civil servant who um, had mentioned something about our briefing paper and, and how we were going down the, the route of, you know, assuming that there would be two pay from local authorities. Um, and he says that was a bit, you know, presumptuous of us to assume that, um, and that's not what the bill says. And our answer at that point was, but the bill doesn't say it either. So this is, where, this is where those concerns come, where you've got a framework, people start making up their own minds about what that framework means when there's no guarantees and no outcomes of co-design as yet. Okay. Thank you, Paul. You, you, thanks for those, those responses, because the policy memorandum does speak about you know, work floor, workforce employment and contractual arrangements being subject to that secondary legislation process, and that includes the transfer of staff from local authorities potentially. So would it be fair to say that at no point the government came to you and said there's a potential within this bill for 75,000 staff to transfer and that that might involve a chupy process? I think that's fair. Um, but it was, it was immediately obvious on the first reading of it, but nobody came to us in advance of the publication of the bill and said there is a risk um, or there is a likelihood or there is a certainty and none of the above applied. We could read it for ourselves when yeah. it was published. I, ju I just find it extraordinary that nobody came to the trade unions and said, potentially, this is a process. I, I wonder if I can then just uh, talk about the finance of all of that, because obviously that involves, you know, the requirement for, you know, if you're doing a massive structural change like that, that brings with it a financial uh, burden. Uh, and there's been a lot of commentary in this committee and in other committees about the financial memorandum that accompanies the bill. So... Um, you know, we've heard it referred to perhaps as a blank check. Um, and I just keen to get your sense of, of what that could mean in terms of the finances for local authorities. I know check because if you're going to bring all these 1,200 employers under one umbrella and pay them all the same rate and we level everybody up, fantastic, because that's what you're going to need is a blank check. That's hugely, hugely expensive. It's hugely, hugely time-consuming bringing everybody together and harmonising all of their terms and conditions. I mean, 32 different social workers in Scotland working um, within the local authorities will all be paid at different rates. They will have different conditions attached to it. There would need to be harmonisation and it needs to be fully funded. Um, so um, there's not a blank cheque. We're not, you know, not expecting there to be. There never has been. I've dealt with multiple different harmonisations we were... Um, I was in the local government committee before I came in here talking to some old timers a bit like me who remember local government reorganisation back in 1996 and how much money that took to create the 32 unitary councils and harmonise all the conditions. It took years. It was painful. We still remember it. Um, and it was, it's expensive. Um, it would be an absolute ideal. It would be utopia for us 
if everybody was on the top line, if everybody was on the higher rates. But we recognise that that's perhaps not realistic. OK, moving on to finances in more detail. Uh, Sandesh, you have some questions? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, convener. Um, <clears throat> we're hearing that the cost to set up the NCS could be up to £1.5 do you think this expensive restructuring is the best way to improve social care delivery? And Tracy, if I could start with you. No. And I think you've heard from us as to why. Um, I mean, the Conservative estimate is half a million. Um, we've actually, half a million, half a billion. Um, we've actually no idea what the actual cost will be, but we understand fully that these things are never quite as they first appear. Um, often costs will escalate and it is entirely the wrong time to be spending upwards to £1.5 billion putting in structural change when we are facing the most inordinate pressures on our everyday NHS services and on our social care services. So uh, just the answer is no. Yeah. And so when you say Conservative, it's not the Conservative Party. with parties. a small C. Um, and so... And, and, and Tracy, can I just stay with you? Because what, and I, I want you to be clear, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but what I'm hearing, and this is why my, what my question is, do you trust that all the things on this bill are going to be delivered at this cost? And do you believe that staff will be looked after? No. Could you explain why? I think trust takes some time to develop. Um, I don't think it's an inherent lack of trust in the Scottish Government. You've heard me describe some good examples of that in the past. Um, but no, I, I, it's back to this, uh, I suppose, discussion about buying something off plan. I, I need some more guarantees. I need some more detail. I would not be spending that amount of money. I'd rarely spend a huge amount of money on anything without being clear about what I was getting for my money and where the value would be. And there's insufficient details on so many fronts in here for me to say that I have confidence that if we just take the feely side of things, the sectoral bargaining will all work out the way we would like it to. Um, I worry that we will lose even more of the workforce as it becomes the, the least attractive place to work. Uh, and that ends up costing more money, even just simply recruiting staff costs money. Placing the ad costs money, never mind training them, developing them and retaining them. So there's there's really nothing in this that fills me full of confidence at this stage. Okay. Thank you. And, and my final question. Um, sorry, Mary, did you want to come in on that? Um, yeah, just, just to say that, um, you know, we firmly believe that the money that has been spent on it is better spent addressing the issues, the immediate issues that there are in that sector just now given the cost of living crisis, given the fact that, uh, you know, the, the survey that we done of members, which was all over 500, um, they can't get to the end of the month without running out of money and borrowing from financial institutions or family and friends. So, you know, there's, there's very serious issues that we've discussed. And, you know, that money is better spent now, given, the, you know, where we are uh, in this country. Uh, with the financial crisis and the economy is better spent on addressing those immediate issues and then pausing, listening to some of the challenges and the issues that, that we are highlighting and looking at solutions and trying to get some actions lined up on those, like delivering sectoral bargaining. Ros wanted to come in. Yeah, just to back that up, I think that we would like to see that money that's that's clearly been put aside uh, for this being used to address the cost of living crisis. Uh, the First Minister said that we're facing an emergency, humanitarian emergency situation. And so for us, part of the, the resolution to that is diverting money in our, in our budget to those who need it the most. That means putting money into low-paid workers' pockets, um, now, uh, it means giving people what they need to get through this crisis situation. And we could use that time instead to get the provisions in this bill right over the next couple of years and, and make sure that we actually do. Uh, you know, it's, it's buying off plan without a plan at the moment. We, you know, we could develop and co-design 
a plan that we can all see and get, and get these issues out in the open and then take it forward. Um, and in the meantime, use some of the money that's been earmarked for this uh, to deal with the crisis that's right under our nose, and that's about putting money in workers' pockets. I'm going to bring in Carol Mockin. Carol? I'm really um, interested to explore the leakage of, of profit and, and social care that has been mentioned at the start. Um, I'm very impressed with the report from the STUC, and I would suggest that everybody on the committee reads it. I'm hoping it is in as part of our evidence. I wonder if Rose and, in fact, all the panel members might be able to just give us some key aspects from that that we should be considering, because I know most of the trade unions did con contribute to that work. Who would like to go first? <laughs> I think I've covered uh, quite a bit of it, but obviously, as uh, mentioned, we have a real concern about the level uh, of when people are paying fees for care, the amount of those fees that are being diverted and, and sucked out uh, before it gets to uh, being used for service provision. So we found that uh, you were talking up to 30% for some of the big private sector providers as opposed to more like 3% uh, for not-for-profit providers. Now, that is a huge difference, and that is money that could be retained uh, to deliver frontline services if we took a different approach uh, to how we design a national care service. Profits should have no place in the delivery of social care. Um, and at the moment, sadly, they, they do, and, and that's part of the model. It's a commercial model in far too many parts of the sector. Um, we also found that public sector uh, provision, the workers uh, are paid on average £1.60 an hour more uh, than care workers who work in the private sector. And as I said, staffing levels uh, in elder people care homes uh, that are private sector are 20% less uh, than, than non-private sector uh, institutions. So these are big, big differences that I don't believe we can ignore uh, when we're looking at how we take forward and design a, a national care service that's fit for purpose for the future. Money is tight, so why are we allowing that money to go to profiteers when it could be used for frontline services? Thank you. We move on to our final theme, final um, questions from Emma Harper and then Stephanie Callahan. Then we'll need to uh, round up. Okay. Emma. Thanks very much. Um, I, I suppose um, my understanding about the financial issue is that the, the costs that have been projected for the bill are estimates that are already being used for health and social care. So this isn't like 1.5 million billion of money that's just coming from somewhere else. It's already part of the the the, the, the care delivery that's already happening on the ground. That's my understanding. Anyway, I, I suppose, um, which might be worth picking up as an additional. And then my questions were about training and research yeah. again, but I think we've covered a lot of the issues around the necessity for like training being standardised, that could be part of a national approach to help support the staff. Because on the ground, this is about what the people who are in receipt of care wanted. They want a national care service. The folk that are um, being cared for, but also carers providing the care, they can see what can be fixed. They, they know what works. We know that self-directed support works really well in some places, but doesn't it in others? So this creation of this National Care Services Bill is about helping support people on the ground because that's what people wanted. So that's something that I'm interested in. And then the training that around that that will help deliver what the folk on the ground are asking for. Well, I, I think I would make an initial response to what you're saying and then pass to my colleagues. But so do we. We want a National Care Service, but there's no point in having something that's called a national care service when really all we're talking about is a national commissioning service. Um, so, you know, let's have a transformative national care service and let's take the time to do it properly and, and, and do the name justice uh, in terms of what we deliver. Um, and that means bringing the workforce with you and, and, and really working uh, 
to get it right and listening to, to the concerns that workers are, are raising. Um, on the financial part of the issue, that's not my understanding, but if what you're saying is right, then that gives me even more cause for concern that that is completely and utterly unrealistic to expect that it would be done from effectively within existing budget. No, uh, I know there will be additional money that will be added to it, but the, the complexities of the whole financing of care and care delivery with the 1,200 providers, with people doing care at home and care in residential homes, the whole thing is really complicated. So trying to iron out the, the, whole, the, the whole approach is something that uh, it, it, this bill looks, looks to be doing. I mean, the fundamental is that if we're going to get the sort of care service that, that our citizens require and deserve, then we're going to need significant frontline investment. Uh, and, and that means new additional funding that isn't there at the moment uh, to, to deliver uh, in terms of pain conditions, but also in terms of resources so that, that care users can get a decent level of service. And, you know, we can call things whatever we want, we can organise them whatever way we want, but we need that additional funding uh, to be put in, and that needs to be realistically uh, accounted for. I pass Mary, to my colleagues. Yeah, Mary wanted to come in, and then I'll, I'll go to Stephanie for the final question. Yeah, just just quickly, I, I you obviously echo what Ros has said, and you know I know that there has been other bodies like the Audit Commission that has queried the finance, uh, you know, and then the provision that's been made as a, you know, um, I, I wouldn't say unrealistic. Um, I don't think that's the word they use, but um, it was it was querying that those were um, sensible. Uh, projections to deliver, you know, the, the National Care Service. Um, and, uh, you know, as Ros says, that, uh, you know, the whole point about the National Care Service is about driving up standards, quality of care, addressing workforce issues. And you can't do that within, you know, the cost envelope that, you know, has, has, has been set out. There has got to be more resource put in uh, to this and a greater understanding of, and of the issues and the, pro, the, the solutions to those issues and, and those costed. Thanks. Thank you. Um, final question to our panel, Stephanie, and then we must round up. Thanks very much, convener. Um, I'll direct my question to Cara, please. Um, you spoke earlier on, Cara, and, and, and obviously you were really passionate about it and quite emotional about the fact that, you know, care workers are just at breaking point that they've been faced with an incredibly, incredibly difficult time. And I know certainly we've got we've got other um we've got nurses, etc. as well, who have faced an equally tough time too. But they have this image in the public, um, you know, of, you know, people appreciate that nursing is a real vocation, that it's very, very skilled, that there's a huge amount of appreciation, which perhaps social care workers don't always get. So I'm really interested in, in what you think might be the benefits and what might be the risks as well of a prerequisite for a uh, prospective social care staff to have qualifications um, and also in how we might look to attract young people into that workforce and show them that it could be a job that can be really worthwhile and really enjoyable. Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think that Obviously, all, all the things that we've spoke about today, you know, our key asks on how to make social care more attractive. Um, you know, that it's a starting point there. Um, the, the, the problem that you have with care is, is that even new people coming in and younger people, they're, they're being met with, you know, a line of staff that's so exhausted, so tired and so undervalued that that rubs off on them right away. Which is why we want a, you know, we want a reform of social care to start, you know, having them as professional workers, making sure that their training and their qualifications are up to date, making sure that we're paying them a professional wage, you know, minimum fifteen pounds an hour. Um, but also, we want a, we want people to have pride that they work in care. Um, we need to bring the workers along with us. Because right now, on the ground, the workforce feel like it's full of empty promises again. Um, just kind of again back to COVID, you know, when we were talking about, you know, provisions of PPE and stuff like that. Um, 
you know, they, they were told they didn't need certain provisions to do their job. They were told that, you know, that that's fine. You don't need that. Nurses do need that. And the result in that was a lot of care workers died. That's that's just the, the, the bottom line of it. So we're now asking people to put trust in building the care sector again, um, which again has already been mentioned by my colleague. That does take time and it's going to take a lot of hard work. Um, this doesn't just come down to money. It, 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 it comes down to putting the time and the resources into making these workers feel valued and that they're part of something. Thank you. We must uh, round up today. I want to thank our four panel members for the time that they've taken this morning to take us through um, their, their views on the National Care Service. Our next meeting in the, uh, the committee will continue our scrutiny of the National Care Service with a further two evidence sessions, but that does conclude our uh, public session of the meeting today. Thank you.